recording. Okay, so this question, okay, TVM, time value of money, and it's something that you could see on your exam. And what we're gonna do first is we're gonna read it together. Then we're gonna identify the only things you should really even think about when looking at TVM questions. And then we're gonna look at it from a calculator perspective, as well as a formula perspective, if you wanna use you know, pen and paper. And from there, we're gonna be able to solve the answer together. So let's go about it. So your friend Lucas makes you the following offer. He will pay you back the money he borrows today over the next 15 years, okay? He's gonna make yearly payments with the first payment being for $1,000.88 at the end of this year, all right? The payments will grow by 15% every year thereafter. If the appropriate discount rate, okay? If the appropriate discount rate is 5%, how much would you be willing to lend Lucas today? So with that, we're gonna try to find the most important things to remember as of right now, and then maybe I'll even show you, um, if you guys remember, but you could look at the recording, kind of what type of checklist do we want when we do a time value of money question, okay? So we'll, we'll do like both approaches. So before we begin, um, can you guys tell me what are things that we should probably highlight in this question? What is like important information in this question? What is something that you would maybe try to identify if you were highlighting stuff on your exam? What would you highlight? At the end of this year, since it'll, this will tell us if the annuity is due or not. Hell yeah, there you go. That's what I'm talking about. I'm just gonna up the volume because I can't hear you all too well. Yeah, 100%. At the end of this year is actually the first checklist, right? It's one of the first checklists. You wanna know whether the payment is happening at the beginning of the year or it's happening at the, at the end of that year, okay? And by knowing either or, you will be able to decide whether you're dealing with a normal annuity or an annuity due. So that's an amazing pointer. What is something else that we could look for? Could somebody else tell me either by your voice or by you know writing it in the chat? What is something else? Anybody could give it a shot. Fifteen years, amazing. There you go. Fifteen years is super crucial. That's amazing. Now we get to know how long is this even lasting, right? One of the first checkpoints or like things to look for when doing a time value of money question is understanding what type of length are we kind of dealing with? Is it a set of cash flows that are going to last forever or is it a defined set of cash flows? What I mean by forever is literally a like in perpetuity, you know? And when I say it's a defined, it's a specific amount of years. All right, then Georgia says that the payment will grow by 15%. That's an amazing, amazing, amazing insight because now we know that this is growing by 15%, all right? And if you look at the checklist, which I'll plug in in just a second, it's really looking at three buckets. The first one being, is it a defined set of cash flows or is it a undefined set of cash flows? And with that, you then wanna look for whether it's happening at the end of the year or it's happening at the beginning of the year. We already did those two. Now, the last one, the last checkpoint, the last segment would be to see whether our cash flows or our payments are growing or if they're constant. In this case, they're not constant and they're actually growing every single year by 15%. So from there, we know that we're dealing with a specific type of annuity. And not only that, we're dealing with a growing annuity, okay? So that's super important. Now, I'm gonna plug something in in just a second and it's gonna be like a really good structure to follow when doing all things related to time value of money. In other words, all things related to chapter five. All right, so that's another really good pointer. Are we missing something else? Is there one last thing that we should probably highlight here that we did not highlight just yet? What do you all think? Exactly, it's the K, it's the interest rate. The interest rate is super crucial. And the interest rate could have a bunch of names. It could be the discount rate, it could be the opportunity cost, it could be the interest rate. So you kind of just want to look for another percentage that's not called a growth something or a growth rate, okay? So with that said, I'm just gonna take some time to go screenshot a super duper crucial thing that you should all maybe add to your formula sheet if that's something that you would like to do because it's a really good structure and it gives you all the frameworks and all the different types of payments or different types of cash flows you may see on an exam. 
So I'll actually plug it in right here and we'll look at it right now. It's going to be a quick summary of what we just said. So when you're looking at chapter five, once again, there's only a few things that you want to look for. Okay, just in terms of like key indicators, which is as what I said before, there are three of them. It's whether our cash flows are defined or whether they're lasting forever. Then when are those payments within those cash flows happening? So is it at the end of a period or is it at the beginning of a period? And then we want to see if it's growing or defined. And what's dope here is that you notice that you kind of have that structure laid out for you. And then within those, you're able to figure out quickly what type of formula do you want to use, right? In this case, we said, okay, it's a defined period and with payments happening at the end of a period and those payments are growing. Therefore, we could only be dealing with a growing normal annuity in which there's only one specific formula that we need to care about. This is like your holy grail. You use this, you will be able to figure out exactly what formula you need to use on an exam, okay? Very, very, very important. Now, another thing that I'd like to notice, to note here, is that when we do chapter five questions, when we do time value of money, uh, questions, there are really only a few things, a few variables that we need to find in our questions, okay? You don't need to be innovative. You don't need to be creative. You literally just have to be able to pinpoint like a finite, very small set of variables, right? And there are, there are really five of them, which is payment, K, G, N, and honestly, I think there's actually only four of them, right? There's only four key variables that you need to find, okay? And then after that, that's going to get you either the present value or the future value. So when you are doing these questions, you really only need to seek four things, payment, K, G, and N. That's all you need to figure out in this formula or in these questions, in these prompts, okay? Other than the quick structures in, in order to figure out what formula to use. But the variables, they're the same. So technically, you know, there's only like what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's like seven formulas, probably only really six that you need to know. So technically, if you just plug in your information within those formulas, you have a one over six chance of getting the right answer. So just some pointers here. Okay, that said, so our payment in this scenario is obviously 1,088. And what I did here is I took the chance to, I took the time actually, to build a timeline for y'all, okay? To build a little timeline in which it's gonna show us, okay? We have T0, which is today. We have T1 all the way up to T15. So this is our little timeline and it's essentially from today all the way to year 15. And we wanna figure out with all those payments, right? What will be the present value? How much total money we would be willing to provide to our friend, okay? So in this case, this uh, timeline is actually gonna work in real time for us, all right? So what's really cool is that we obviously know that this is a growing set of cash flows, and we know it's growing by 15% a year. So, because we highlighted that together. So now what's really cool is that you actually get to see your cash flows growing every single year, all right? This is what I would do if you, if you build a timeline on an exam. It's growing by 15%. 15%, 15%, all the way to the last cash flow, all the way to the last payment. So 15% every single year. All right. But now we need to solve, right? We need to solve for this famous number. We need to solve for this famous, famous present value by plugging in our K and by plugging in our N. And now I'm going to be annoying. And I'm going to ask y'all, okay, what would be, and actually, I guess it could be even more annoying. I'll show you what's the answer right now, and then I'm going to change the answer just a little bit, change the question just a little bit. And I'm going to ask you to use the formula and identify the key points, and then tell me what's the answer. And I'll give you like two minutes. So like that's interactive, all right? So in this case, obviously, um, actually I'll stop talking. So far, is the timeline clear? Do you understand how obviously we are growing our payments every single year? Is that clear for everybody? 1,088 times 15%, you know, all the way to year 15. Everybody, is that clear? I, I don't like talking too much. <laughs> I just need to see a few yeses to make sure that we're all on the same page. Okay, amazing stuff. Then obviously, we need to discount these cash flows, right? Technically, if we didn't use the formula, we would need to discount these cash flows for every single year and then sum them all up, and that would be our present value. 
right? Because we know that money in the future may not be as valuable today. So if we plug in our famous 5% discount rate, we actually get discounted cash flows every single year. Notice how 1,036 is smaller than 1,088 and call it 5,062 is smaller than 2819. So if you add up all of these together, you will actually get your present value. And this right here would be how much you're willing to lend your friend Lucas today, all right? So that said, I'm gonna be a little bit more annoying, okay? I'm gonna create a question with y'all right now. I'm actually gonna delete everything here, okay? And we're gonna essentially give you guys maybe two or three minutes to solve this question because on an exam, you would only have two or three minutes to solve such a question. And in fact, this question being so simple in comparison to other like theoretical, you know, mind numbing ones, you could even maximize your time by only taking one minute here and allocating your time to other questions. But anyways, enough blah, blah, blah for me. So what we could do, all right, is we're gonna say that this is over 10 years, okay? We're gonna say that this is over 10 years and we're gonna say that you are gonna, your friend Lucas is ready to maybe give you 1,578 at the end of this year. All right, and the payments will grow by 12.5%, and your discount rate will be 7.5%, okay? And with all this information, I'm going to ask you, could you tell me, how much would you be willing to lend Lucas today? And in other words, what would be your present value? So I'm going to have my timer right here, and I'm going to give you all three minutes to give it a shot. Three minutes, then everybody, when you have the answer, just plug it in the chat, okay? Plug it in the chat. You have the formula in front of you. You have to build a timeline if you want to. And you also have kind of all the data points that you need. Okay. So three minutes starting now. Please give it a shot. We only really, we're only doing four questions today, right? So you have like quite a lot of time. Don't you worry to kind of try stuff out. And you could ask me, by the way, questions in the chat if you want. Like you could send me a message privately. I'm right here and I'll answer them if you have any questions. Okay, got one answer. That's amazing stuff. I need everybody to give it a shot. And to be honest with you, I don't even know the answer yet. Actually, I could know it if I do it on the side too. It's more fun if we do it together. I'm not gonna lie. You got one answer. I believe we have a minute and 20 seconds left. We got, okay, I, then 
Uh, I'll give you all 36 more seconds though still because I want everybody to give it a shot. But it seems like everybody kind of got the answer, which is amazing. Okay. So let me just, I mean, it seems like you guys know what to do. <laughs> but that said, um, let's go straight to it then. There's only 20 seconds left. And I gave you guys technically three minutes and 20 seconds. All right, so let's give it a shot. So in this case, what I'm going to do is simple. I obviously have this like calculator in front of me, so it's going to do it for me. But what I, what I do want to do is obviously show you how this would look like on a timeline. So we'll go ahead and erase a few things. All right, we'll go ahead and erase a few things. So in this case, if you were to build a timeline, which I believe is the first thing to do after you've kind of highlighted all the information uh, points given in the question, I would just build my timeline. And your timeline essentially will go, if I know how to not butcher my Excel, will go up until to T10, right? You're gonna go from T0 all the way to T10 because your friend Lucas is gonna borrow money for the next 10 years and make payments at the end of every single year to repay you. Okay, so that's great news, okay. Now we know that those payments, right, will begin at the fair price of $1,578, right? So right there, you quickly already see that you could populate your timelines. However, those different payments are growing by 12.5% per year. So our payments will begin by being 1578 all the way to this amount. But you on an exam, you don't care about that because you just got to plug it in within your formula. So if we were to maybe zoom in on our formula here, and I'll erase a few things. Oh, no worries, no worries. And if, if, you, if we were to kind of just plug it into our formula here, uh, there we would already have our payments. We know that. We have our G. We know that. That's great stuff. And then we know that our K is seven and a half percent. So we have all of our discounted cash flows now. Okay. And we know that our N in this case would be 10. So in your formula, which took you two seconds to plug in, you already have this, you already have this, you have this, you have this. It's great news. Okay. In this case, all that I have to do is just sum these ones together. And hopefully we have the same answer. Whoops. There you go. So yeah, you get 18,165 and 32 cents. That is how you would essentially do this type of question. And seamless, like seemingly, this seems like a pretty, you know, straightforward question. You know, we were able to do it together. We identified the four variables we need in any time value of money question. And then we just had to plug it in into our formula. Yeah, and exactly, it was on the midterm. That's why it's so funny because it was in our course pack ahead of the midterm, right? This same question was literally in you know, our course pack. You just had to review the course pack and you have had this free, what was it, 1.5 marks? The exam was on how much? Just tell me for fun. The exam was on how much? Uh, oh, it was on 100, but you guys, on 32, okay. So, do that. I'm not trying to do mental math. You essentially on 23. Okay. On how many marks? That's my question. <laughs> on how many marks? Well, the idea here is that you would have a minimum, a minimum. Okay. About 4% of your mark on the exam. That's what I'm trying to say here. What I'm trying to articulate is that if you would have gotten this question correct, all right, if you would have gotten this question correct, which was easily available on my, on my deck, you would have gone 5% extra on your exam, assuming you didn't get this question already okay. So that's why I really want to double down. And this is like a free thing that's out there, right? The study guide is out there for free. I really do suggest following the study guide because, okay, because you'd be surprised how many questions will actually be on your exam, okay? You'd be surprised how many questions will actually be on your exam. And for that reason, it's, it's really important to just... Okay. But um, yeah, so that's why it's crucial to kind of just, you know, do the questions in the course back. But overall, knowing that this was on the midterm, so obviously this is an exam-like question. Uh, yeah, it was in my course pack. 
by the way, for those of you who aren't in the member group, like I think it's like two or three, um, in our group chat, I share all of you know my notes that are available on my website, which is the course back. I, I send a lot of stuff out there, you know. And if you go through them, you will find really good questions, right? And for those that are in the member group, the Google folder is full of gems, full of different types of questions. There's about a hundred plus questions out there. For sure, that's a lot. But just doing half would still give you more exposure than you know others. So, anyways, all that said, we obviously know that this is a exam-like question, right? But we were able to do it quite easily. Okay. How do we feel about seeing a question like this again on the exam? Are we confident? Do we feel okay with that? Okay. Well, I, I see one. Yeah. Do we have any questions about this? Do we have any questions about this? Like, what's up? I've seen similar questions in which the G will, let's say, increase or decrease after five years. How would you do that at this point? We could do it in two ways, right? In the end of the, at the end of the day, no matter what, and that's the beauty of like a timeline, right? Let's say that, um, let's say up until year five, the G was 12 and a half percent, okay, which is here. Then I'm gonna change my formula just a little bit, just because I'm lazy to kind of write another, another portion to it. But check this out. Let's say that I say that after that, the growth rate is 5% because it has to like kind of chill a little bit, okay? Let's say I do that. Obviously, our stuff is going to be growing at a different rate. Uh, actually, hold up. Let me just do this instead. Give me a second. Do this instead. Uh, uh, uh. Just got to build the Excel, unfortunately. And I'll show you what I mean. What I mean. Uh, yeah, for sure, for sure. No worries, no worries. So I'll go through the steps in just a second. I just want to show out. Um, yeah, I'm just going to do um, kind of what it means to have different growth rates, right? Different annuity growth rates, having different growing payments, right? So we said in this case that we would be growing by 12.5% all the way to year five, okay? So I could guess I could put this in yellow here. After that, we're going to grow. Okay, now right here, grow by 5% every year. Okay, so we're just going to do this times 1, 0, 5. All right, and we're going to do that for every single year. Okay, so obviously now this is growing by 5% every single time. So it's going to be growing by a smaller amount. But what you notice here, for sure, present value decreased, right? Because our future payments are not going to be as big, right? So obviously our future cash flows are gonna be slightly smaller. But what's really interesting is that no matter what, it's not like the, the game plan is changing, okay? Which you would do either on an exam, there's three ways of doing it. There's a long logical way, which would be to find the cash, you know, the payments you're gonna receive every single year and then discount them one by one and then adding them to your, uh, adding them together to find the sum of all those future cash flows and that would be your present value. But what you could also do, right? You could also do this. You could also find what would be your annuity, right? Based on the two scenarios given. So check this out. What you could do is assume that the first annuity, the first growing annuity is the point at which your G is 12 and a half percent. But then you could have another annuity, another growing annuity where it's only growing by another amount growing by 5%, okay? So what you could do is you could find simply your payment right here, right? That you're expected to, re to receive at year five, which is 2,528. 2500, uh, 2, and then that would become your new payment one, right? From our formula, that would be our new payment one. This would be our variable. Our K would remain the same. Our G would now be 5%. And then, our G would be 5% here, and our K would be still 12 and a half, uh, sorry, seven and a half percent, right? And then your N would be five, okay? And in that case, no pun intended, you would just solve for the present value. However, that present value would be given at T equals five around. Then you would just have to discount that present value all the way to today, 
That's how you would do it if you want to use two formulas, right? In the case that they give you two different growth rates. Now, depending on how you know suave you are with it, depending on how smooth you, you are with it, you could decide to go the long route, right? But on an exam, you would focus on all the questions you know how to do. Can I make an example like this right now off the top of my head? Probably, but it would still ask you to do, um, I still need to ask you to find, whatchamacallit, the present value and use the formulas for both scenarios, okay? I would still require you to do so. However, what I can do, if you guys don't wanna try to do that on your own, I could try to write it up on paper and then send it into the group chat afterwards. But if we, if you want, I could build, we could try to like do it ghetto, right? As I did right now and kind of like maybe change um, our payments at the beginning and change our K. Okay, so in the group chat. All right, good, amazing. So that's your, that's, that's the answer your question, okay? On what to do if you are given two growth rates. What I would like to kind of summarize because obviously I was kind of like brainstorming as I was talking. But what I do want you to understand though, is that the reason why a timeline is so powerful is because you really get to look at it from the perspective of a five-year-old. I don't know if you've ever seen like those wired YouTube videos where they explain like physics or biochemistry or I don't know, game theory uh, in five different stages. So to a kindergartner, to a you know PhD candidate, blah, blah, blah. What we do here is we try to look at it from the perspective of the kindergartner, right? By using a timeline, we're able to do so. We're able to literally just see, well, what the heck are our payments at any given date? Okay, and that's what we did on, on, on the screen. You know, you see 1,578, 1,775, and so on and so forth. By doing so, you can get your stuff wrong because then the, uh, the next step for you is simply to discount the cash flow at that time, right? Which is simple. Your discount rate will always be the same, right? Then you just gotta use the formula, your simple discounting formula, right? So for example, it could be X over one plus K the power of n. And you can do that for all the specific years, okay? That's what we're really doing. And these formulas that I'm highlighting right here, right, that we have to know for our time value of money section of Comp 308 or your intro to finance class is simply expediting that process and making it easier for you. So instead of doing it on a year-to-year -year basis, T1, T2, T3, T4, blah, 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 you could actually just break it down into two separate growing annuities. Why? Because they're using different growth rates in this like ghetto gorilla example I gave you. Okay. Now for Michael, who said, can you give me a quick summary? I got you. I'm going to take two minutes to do so. So uh, yeah, hundred percent. And then what I would like to say really quickly though, just for Michael, uh, check this out. So what we did is we highlighted a few things. We said, okay, we know that a friend Lucas is gonna make us an offer similar to what was on the exam. Over the next 15 years, the payment of 1,088, uh, the payment will grow by 15%. And we know that the appropriate discount rate is 5%. Now, as I said, remember when we did for the first midterm is literally there are only three things that we care about, right? Is, is this a defined set of cash flows? Is this a cash flows that's gonna last forever? Then once we know that, we're gonna figure out when are these payments happening? In this case, it's at the end of the year, okay? So this brings us to a different type of subset of formulas. But if it was at the beginning of the year, we would probably only be dealing with an annuity due, okay? Once you figure that out, whether it's at the beginning or at the end of the year, you figure out whether it's a defined set of cash flows or a growing set of cash flows. In this case, it's obvious to us that we're dealing with a growing annuity, okay? But what's interesting also, another cue to have when dealing with chapter five, is to understand that there really only are four variables that you'll ever need to know. Literally only four. Payment, K, your interest rate, or your discount rate, your opportunity cost. Then G, which is the growth rate. And then N, which is the number of years. Once you've figured those four things out, like it's really hard to mess it out, to mess it up. Because you only need to know four things and then plug them in within a formula. In this case, that's exactly what we did. We plugged it in within the formula. So payment, right? We have our K, we have our G, and we have our N. And that gave us our present value of 31,705 and four cents. In the recording, you'll be able to look at the second version of this that I asked everybody to do for two to three minutes, okay?
Whew, I'll drink a little bit of water because I was trying to talk a little bit fast. But before we move on, any questions, any qualms, anything that's not clear before we move on to our second TVM question? Are we good? There's a quick yes or no in the chat. Quick yes or no in the chat. Uh, the payoff table. So like that's chapter 12, you mean? That's hundred percent. I got you, 100%. Um, if we go on our study guide, I believe we're touching options on Monday, okay? We're gonna be touching options in detail on Monday, all right? Uh, today, we're focusing on TVM. We should be doing bond valuation, but we did equity valuation instead. So tomorrow, just focus in on some bond valuation. But it seems like equity valuation is what the common thread of students are kind of like struggling with. So that's why I wanted to double down on that. But that said, Let's do our second question. Let's do our second question. Okay. This one's this one's pretty fun. All right. So as per usual, this is one of the questions that maybe you see on your exam. Wink wink. I don't know. But um, it's really not the classical TVM question. This question is where you need to understand what the heck is time value of money? Why does it matter? Right? Why do we care about it? And this question really seeks to highlight that little uh, that little twitch you need, right? So let's read it together. Then we're gonna highlight the key pieces of information. We're gonna add it into our uh, information box and then we're gonna to try to solve it together. Once we do it together, I'm gonna to ask you to do another version of it on your own. We have like three to four minutes, right? And then we're gonna kind of just answer your remaining questions, okay? So Marie won uh, the 649. So she won the lottery today and she was given two options of payments by the, the lottery people, all right? So she was given one option, which was an annual payment of $3,250,000 a year for the next 25 years, or the option of gaining a lump sum payment of $35 million today. What interest rate would make her feel totally indifferent between the two options? All right, what interest rate would make her feel totally indifferent between the two options? Then if Marie considers investing in the risk Free rate at 2%, what option between the annual payments and the lump sum payment will be the best for her? Okay. So before we go on, can you tell me what are the key pieces of, of information that we would want to highlight here? What do we care about? Okay, so we have our annual annual payments, 100%. I think that's pretty important. What else? The number of years, 100%. Hell yeah. What else we got? What else do we care about? Oh, okay, I like that. Yeah, the present value. The present value of the money that's available to us, in this case, would be the lump sum. I guess that's what you're going for. Um, any other questions, that, any other uh, points that could be interesting? I think there's one last one that's like kind of interesting, although it's probably part of the second part. What would be this? There you go. The risk free rate. Exactly. The risk free rate. Okay. So that's pretty much, you know, all the stuff that I would probably look into myself when doing a question like this. The next step, though, is because me, I, and I don't know if I have my booklet with me now. But usually how I do questions when I took this class is I would literally just write everything down like once, even after I've, I've like highlighted them. So in this case, we've highlighted all the information. It's pretty clear what we need to know and what we, not, what we don't really care about. But then I even go even more OCD and I like type it in into my information box. So kind of just something that you may want to do. It's just good active recall. But before we uh, kind of continue and dive into the question, I would like to highlight one little, like, I guess, a big part, actually. What the heck is time value of money? And I feel like that's a really good conversation to have together because time value of money is definitely nuanced, right? And it's simply saying something very simple. It's saying that maybe there's a, there's a nuance to the value of our money depending on where we are relative to time. So, for example, let me give everybody a really simple example. Would you rather a million dollars today or $5 million one year from now? What option would you take? 
Everybody is super quickly. A million dollars today versus $5 million next year. The pet, in what world? Where, where, where are you guys investing? Could you let me know? Because I'm clearly not investing my money right then. A million dollars today versus $5 million in 365 days. You only got to wait 365 days and you get $5 million. What's the catch? It's just a simple question. Just a simple question. But what I like is that we had a conversation here. We, we like, there's a nuance. Part says it depends. Pounder says a million dollars. You know, uh, Michael said $5 million next year. So clearly, based on our preferences, based on the skills we have in investing and this type of, uh, you know, resources we have available to us, our decision on money will definitely um, vary. I don't know about you, but me, I would rather $5 million next year. I don't know anywhere where I'm making 500% return on my money. I don't know anywhere where I could 5x my money like that in a legal way. I don't know if that's even possible. But still, we had a conversation. It's a nuanced idea. Money, you know, in a year from now may really clearly not be as worth it as money today. There's something beautiful about guaranteeing something that's in your hands. If you could arbitrage five times parts, send me a DM after because we need to figure this out together. But the idea here is that clearly, you know, money is kind of something nuanced. It depends. It varies based on our, on our preferences. Okay. Clearly, money tomorrow may not be as worth it as money today. Okay, simple as that. And this really does depend based on our on our investing rates, etc. But with that said, that's why we kind of need to consider what we could do here. Because maybe Marie would actually prefer getting her three million dollars on a year-to-year -year basis, because the present value of those future cash flows will be bigger than that thirty-five million dollars she's guaranteed today. Okay, it's quite possible. All right, so that's what we're trying to do. This idea of time value of money is really showcasing this idea that, you know, maybe we'd rather money today, right? Maybe we'd rather do that. So that said, um, in this case, we're going to follow the same approach. Okay, we're going to follow the same approach. And as you can see here, um, there's a bunch of little numbers on the screen. So what I did is I built our timeline once again. I'm going to try to zoom in, I guess, like this. So as you can see, we have um, T0 all the way to T25, i.e. we have 25 years, all right? And what we're going to do is we're going to plot the cash flows, right? We're going to plot the $3,250,000 that Marie is expecting on a year-to-year -year basis, okay? Whoops, I added a zero. So as you can see, she's going to be receiving $3,250,000 every single year, okay? Every single year. Can somebody tell me, and it's probably on the screen, how much is, does this total, you know, $3,250,000 equate to after 25 years? How much total money is she actually gonna be getting in her bank account over after 25 years? How much total money will she be getting after 25 years? If we just look at the annual payments, it's a very easy, like, calculation. And if you're very sharp, it's already on the screen. <laughs> so yeah, it's going to be a little bit less than $50 million, right? Could everybody tell me in the chat, is $48,750,000 bigger and or smaller than $35 million? Is it bigger and or smaller? Okay. Everybody here could say that it's bigger, right? $48,750,000 is bigger than $35 million, okay? So that's really, really important. Clearly, you know, it may be more valuable to just go with the money, right? It seems to be more than $35 million. However, unfortunately, there's this idea, I, mean, well, I guess fortunately and unfortunately for us, because you're doing the question, there's this idea that money in the future may not be necessarily as valuable today. Because let's look at it, you know, 20, 25 years from now, I don't know about y'all, I'm gonna be 48, okay? Three million dollars, you know, 25 years from now, it's pretty far, I can't really touch it, I can't really smell it. So maybe it's not worth as much to me today, okay? Maybe it's not worth as much for me today. So let's continue with this example. And I know I'm talking a lot, but it's worth it. Let's go with this example that the, the interest rate 
on the market, okay, for the market index, uh, for the S&P 500, not assuming today's crisis, you know, our, late, our latest crisis here where everything is falling down, let's just say that it's 10%. Let's say that the interest rate is 10%, okay? Let's say that the interest rate is 10%. In this case, the present value of all those future cash flows would only be $24,719,000 approximately. And the reason why is once again, we could clearly see that our $3,250,000 that we were expected to receive at year 25, well, for us, if we have the ability to invest at 10% every single year, would only be worth a little bit less than $300,000 today. Now, is that something clear for everybody here? Do we understand that? Are we comfortable with that? Do we have any questions with that? How are we feeling about this specific notion? I need to see some interaction because I was talking for a lot now. I want to see what y'all think. Is that, is that something that's clear? Do we understand that $3,250,000? Yeah, no problem. Okay. So, a bit unclear. No problem. No problem. So, let's say, I think we could all agree that Marie could take the option right, of receiving annual payments of $3,250,000 a year for the next 25 years. Is that something that everybody here could understand? Yes or no? Say yes or no in the chat. She could take that option. Is that, is that, is that fair? Yeah, 100%. Okay. But by that same token, does everybody here in the chat, okay, you're going to write no in the chat if this is clear, okay? Write no in the chat if this is something that you understand and is clear, just so I can kind of differentiate the yeses and the noes. So write no in the chat if you understand clearly that money today, right, or money tomorrow may not be worth the same today because there's the concept of investing in arbitrage, blah, blah, blah. Write no in the chat. Write no in the chat if you understand that. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Amazing, amazing. amazing. Sorry, that's my... Download the Google Home app on a phone or tablet. My bad. That's my Google, uh, my Google thing. Okay. So we understand that. That's amazing. Cool. So let's say, okay, let's say that our interest rate is 10%. Okay. Let's say that our interest rate is 10%. What does that mean? It means two things. One is this idea of discounting. And then two is this idea of opportunity cost. Let's go with the first option. Because our interest rate is 10%, this means that every single one of these future cash flows is going to be discounted at 10%, okay, for that specific year. So in this case, we're discounting all these cash flows, right? Remember the, the formula, by the way, is payment over 1 plus k to the power of n. And we're doing that for every single year, all the way to year 25, okay? because we understand that money in the future may be worth less today, okay? And the reason, we're going into the second bucket, the reason why money in the future could be worth less today is because of this idea of opportunity cost. If you could invest your money at 10%, okay? 10% is a whole lot. That means that perhaps you would be essentially, I can even make it even more simple, okay? I'm not gonna go that much into theory. What's really interesting is that if you could invest your money at 10%, it means that, to, let's use this example at year three, okay? At year three, we're expected to receive $3.25 million, okay? But we know our interest rate is equal to 10%. So what this means is that somebody or us could invest our money, okay? Could invest this amount right here, which is two point, almost $2.5 million, okay? For three years and get the same amount of money that we expect in three years. Okay, that's a pretty important idea. And we can even do an example if that's not clear. You just let me know, like about this specific little notion. Uh, I mean, 100%, right? 100%, because now your opportunity cost is higher. Why are you using this little, you know, why are you, Gary, why are you playing around with this, uh, this chunk money if you know you could invest and make much more money elsewhere? Right? Why would you get a static amount when you could invest and get you know, gold and a lot of money? Right? Because you could make a lot more somewhere else. It, it goes back to our little example from before where we said a million dollars today or $5 million in a, in a year. Some people have better investment skills. Some people have better resources. So 
your interest rate being bigger is a synonym for better resources. But let me kind of just double down on this idea, on, the, on this very strong notion that we're dealing with. So the present value of money, in this case in particular, we said that our interest rate was 10%. We said it was 10%. And that leads us to a very powerful idea, which is the opportunity cost. Okay? This means that somebody, right, or ourselves, could have invested $2,441,000 today, okay, at T0, and gotten $3.25 million at year three with an interest rate of 10%. So technically, what this is telling you is that, is that you don't necessarily need $3.25 million three years from now. All you need is $2.4 million today to make the same amount of money. That's a powerful idea. That means that $3.25 million that is a static amount in three years is only really worth 2.4 today if you invested at that interest rate of 10%. I'm gonna let you kind of like sit on that. I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna even, I can even send you like an example with math, okay? We can even do an example right now. Could somebody take this amount right here, do 2,441,773, okay? Do that times 1.10 to the power of three. And tell me what this gives you. Everybody do it in the chat. I need everybody to do it, okay? You're gonna see what I mean by this idea of future value and this idea of present value and how you can discount your future value to gain your present value. Now you could accrue interest on your present value to get the future value. It's a lot of blah, 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 blah. But I want you to understand this. I want you to try it out, okay? Everybody do it in the chat. 2,441,773 times 1.10 to the power of three. It's not gonna give you the exact amount because you know we have a few decimal points, but everybody do it, everybody. Put it into your calculator and tell me what you get. I got three answers, I need like two more. I need two more answers. Lean, uh, Vincent, perhaps you could do it. Um, Ver Veronica, you could do it. Charnel, you could do it. Amazing. Okay, cool. So now let me ask you this. Right, no in the chat if this is true. Is this amount right here, which was invested for three years, equal to this amount right here? Right, no in the chat if this is true. Is it like? Is it like almost the same thing? Literally, like, is it not like the same thing? Right, no in the chat if this is true. So I see one no. This amount is equal to this amount, essentially. Right? No in the chat if this is true. It's like very close, if anything. Like it's almost the same amount if you if you round it up. OK, I see two no's in the chat. I, is this the same as this? I need one more no if, to see if you understand. OK? So why did I take the time to talk about that? This idea here is that, once again, when we say that money tomorrow may not be as valuable as money today, it's really because we have the opportunity to invest our money, okay? It's this idea of the opportunity cost. You could invest your money today at a specific rate, and you could gain the same amount of money you were expected to receive in three years. That's a powerful concept. It's a very important topic to understand, okay? So... The higher your interest rate, the, and the higher the interest rate, and the further you go in time, the less you need, the less you need today, right? Because the compounding effect is going to do the job for you. Anyways, I'll stop there. And we're going to... Oh, yes, part. Amazing. Yeah, 100%. I didn't even get there yet. But yeah, like totally, totally, totally. You are on the right track. By the way, you could maybe do a message to everybody like that. Everybody could see what you're writing and they don't think I'm talking to myself like it's so, like a crazy guy. All right. But um, yeah, so that's important to know. So in this case, we clearly see that our present value is $24 million because as we progress through time, our money will be worth less and less and less because we have the opportunity to invest in the stock market on our own. Okay. Some very cool stuff. So that said, we notice here 
that our present value at a rate of 10% is smaller than our initial payment that we could receive today instead. So if the interest rate was 10%, would you rather receive money today or would you rather receive these future cash flows for like 25 years? What would you rather do? What would you rather? If your, if your present value is $24 million, but you could receive $35 million today, what would you rather get? Which one? Which one? Somebody tell me. Write it in the chat. Your present value is $24,719,000, but you could also receive $35 million today. What if, which one of the two options would you rather? Everybody write it in the chat, please. Exactly. Exactly. You would rather receive $35 million today because let's, let's do an example. This is an amazing example and hopefully it kind of resonates to everybody here. So what I'll do, let's check it out. Let's say we do $35 million that we receive today. We're super happy, big smiles. And we do that to the power of 10 for 25 years. Can somebody tell me how much, gosh darn it, money do we get? How much money would you have if you invested $35 million at 10% for 25 years? Can somebody tell me how much money we would have? Because that's what we would do, right? If we're rational people. That's why we're foregoing an option. Okay? I need a few people to write it down. Exactly. We would have about $379 million. That's how much money we would have, $379 million. That's a lot of money if we invested that money today. Now, this is how much total money we were supposed to get in a world where there's no interest rate. This was the total cash, right? This was how much total money we were supposed to get, right? This was literally 3.25 times 25. So this is the total money we were supposed to get. Okay. Is that bigger or smaller than $379 million? Is that bigger or smaller than $379 million? Is $48 million smaller than $379 million? What do y'all think? I don't know. Maybe I got the game wrong. <laughs> Maybe I got the game wrong. Definitely. $48,750,000 is by far way smaller than $379 million, right? By far, it's not even close. It's literally not even close. That's why you would rather have a lump sum today. Or I'm kind of going further into it. On an exam and after this, I'll do, we'll do another example together. I'll tell you what you just need. But the reason why I'm going so far into it is because there's no such thing, although it was possible as we did with the previous question, that you're gonna have a, a copy paste of a question we did that's gonna be on the exam. It's never gonna be exactly the same thing. You're always gonna to have to apply some sort of in like some sort of like innovation. So you're gonna to have to be intuitive. And by understanding the frameworks here and by understanding the foundation, you'll be able to kind of have that latitude to be able to be creative and to really understand what's at play because you'll be able to visualize it. The room won't be as dark anymore. Okay. So Oh yeah, 100%. So Georgia, do $3.25 million times 25, right? Marie is gonna get $3.25 million every year for 25 years. Multiply those two together and what do you get? Tell me. I'm just telling, we're just looking at how much total money would Marie receive over 25 years, right? In actual pure cash in her pockets. Like that's exactly what we're looking at. And the amount would be $48,750,000. I think that's super clear, okay? And the reason why I did the contrast, the reason why I contrasted it with this example was that obviously, if we just take our $35 million right now and invest it at 10% every single year, we would have $379 million after 25 years, which is obviously way bigger than $48,750,000. Okay, that's why, all right? Uh, okay, let me see if I can't do math. I could be wrong.
Oh, my bad, my bad. You're right, you're right. It just didn't go as far. Sorry about that. But still, the, the answer holds. Okay, the answer holds. The answer holds. My bad. It is, it is eighty-one million dollars. My bad. My Excel. That's the that's the demon of uh, of using of using uh, ex, of using you know technology because sometimes you make little errors. But yes, part. It's eighty-one million dollars, but still, eighty-one million dollars is way smaller than thirty-five million compounded at ten percent on a year-to-year -year basis. So no worries. But yes, it would be eighty-one million dollars. Uh, just to give you guys a quick uh, little two cents is I didn't drag this far enough. But anyways, so everybody, when you send me messages, send it to everybody, all right? So like that, you could, everybody could see it rather than me just speaking to myself. So I'll start with the first question that I got, okay? Which was Georgia telling me, um, how did you get $48 million? Which is a totally fair question because what I did is I didn't drag the, the sum of all these the right way, okay? So that was my mistake. But what you would do, yes, would be, we want to figure out how much total money is Marie making, which is $3.25 million times 25. That would give you the big number, $81 million, 250,000. Okay. That is still smaller than our example of $379 million if we were to be invested at 10%. So that's the answer to that question. Parth, you are totally true, correct. Now, Charnel, you asked me, for this question, I assume that we needed to find the annuity because the question mentioned payments. So what tells us that we, can, that we can't just use the regular PV formula? So what I'd like to kind of say here is that you could, you could definitely find the present value, right? But what I was doing, and we will get to what you just said, is that I was just talking right now about the frameworks being at play here, okay? And right now we're just doing the frameworks. I'm trying to explain to y'all what, you know, what is time value of money, why it matters, and giving you logic behind it. For now, that's still what we're doing. In the next five minutes, we're gonna look at a question where you're actually gonna need, like it will, it will be the same question, but you're actually gonna need to apply, you know, your calculator and so forth and so on. But right now I'm just talking about the logic behind it. And I'll do one last step to just tie it all in such that everybody here is comfortable and we're still on the same page. And then I'll take a little break and you guys will be able to do it, okay? So, Last thing I'd like to cover, all right? And I'll do a few, uh, few uh, checkpoints, which I'll just to make sure that we're on the same page. So does everybody understand that $3.25 million times 25 gives us $81 million, 250,000? Yes or no? Just put a yes, no, yes or no in the chat because I made a mistake before. Do we all understand? Okay, sorry about that. That's on me, all right? So we all understand this, cool. Second thing, say no in the chat if you understand that money tomorrow may be worth less today. Quick no in the chat. Just, you know, little summary, making sure we're on the same page. Quick no in the chat. Okay, cool. Amazing stuff, All right. So now the last thing that we're gonna do is gonna be the last little example. We're gonna do this portion right here. We're gonna do this section together and then you're gonna find the point at which they are indifferent, okay? So we're gonna do the last part together. So, on an exam, if they ask you, then if Marie considers investing in the risk-free rate at 2%, what option is best, okay? So what you would do in this case is you would simply find the present value of these cash flows, okay? If you had an interest rate of 2%. Now, it does seem pretty strenuous to do every single one every single one of these cash flows one by one at 2% because there's 25 years. I would not recommend that. What I would do if I were you, and just give me a second, I'm gonna plug in a little calculator right now. So let me just copy paste that onto the screen and you'll see what I, what I would want to do if I were you on an exam. There's this beautiful trick and I would recommend that all of you use this trick. So let me just copy paste this calculator and you'll see what I mean. So on an exam, if you wanna solve for this portion, okay? You want to solve for this portion. This is the calculator. What you would do, okay, is you would simply do a little trick. And there's a bunch of different ways to, do, to use this trick, by the way. However, this is my favorite one. This is just simply the best way of going about it, in my opinion. So what you would do is you would press CF, okay? You would press CF, all right? Everybody, you can take your time to get your calculator, okay? I'm gonna give you guys like 30 seconds. 
take out your calculator and then press CF. Once you will press CF, you're going to see one of two things. I'm not too sure what it is because I'm not using it in my hands right now. But you're going to see either CO0 or like CF0. Can somebody confirm which one you see? Which one is it? CF0 or CO0? Okay, so you see CF0. Amazing. All right. You're going to do CF0 equals to zero if it's not already the case. Once you've done that, you're going to press enter. All right. You're going to press enter. Once you've pressed enter, you are going to do arrow down. Okay. Everybody do arrow down. Once you've done that, you're going to see something as being CO1. Is it CO1, everybody? Do you see CO1 or CFO, CF1? Okay. CO1. Amazing stuff. Once you see CO1, all that you need to do is plug in the payment that was mentioned in the question. In this case, all you need to do is write three point. I'm sorry because I'm using my, my thing here. $3.25 million. Once you've done that, okay, once you've plugged in the number, you know, the payment that is expected to be received, the cash flows that are expected, please press enter. Okay. Once you've pressed enter, you are going to do arrow down again, and you're going to see P1. Does everybody see, uh, does everybody see P1? Click yes in the chat. Oh, sorry, F01. Thank you. It's amazing. You're going to see F01. F01 stands for frequency of the first set of cash flows, okay? Because we know that $3.25 million will be received at a constant for 25 years, all you need to say here for frequency is 25, okay? Frequency is 25, right? Then once you've done that, please press enter, okay? Please press enter. Now, what I would do if I were you, because I hate making mistakes because I didn't plug something in the right way, you're just gonna verify all of your inputs. So you could press the arrow down as many times as you want up until you, know, you feel satisfied, okay? Arrow down, make sure that everything is good, everything is there. All right, that's something that I would always recommend doing. It's an amazing sense check. It's, it saves you like so much, okay? So I'm gonna give you guys like five seconds to do it, blah, 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 verify that all your inputs are correct because sometimes you may forget to press enter, <laughs> okay? Once you've done that, once you've done that, I need you to do something else, okay? You're gonna press NPV, all right? You're gonna press NPV. Once you've, pre once you've done that, you're going to see um, I, if I'm not mistaken. Does everybody see I? Yeah, 100%. Okay, good stuff. You're going to do, you're going to press two. Okay, then you're going to press enter. All right, two being our interest rate in this case, two being the risk free. Okay, so you're going to press two, then enter. Once you've done that, once you've done that, you're going to do second. Actually, no, sorry about that. You're not going to do that. I'm so sorry. That's on me. Once you've done that, my bad. Apologies. Apologies to everybody. You're going to press compute NPV. You're going to press compute NPV. All right. Apologies for the second. Just don't do that. You're going to press compute NPV. Now, can everybody tell me in the chat, what did you get? What did you get as your value? What did you get as your value? What did you get <clears throat> as your value? You can type it in the chat if you can. And if it doesn't work, just let me know. So I see 66,380,543. It'd be awesome if more people could just write down your answers super quick so we could see if we're on the same page. I need a few more answers. Okay, so Rami and Paramvir seem to be on the same ball. Um, like maybe two more answers before I plug it into my into my screen. Okay, cool. So in this case, the answer would be 63 million 251, 220, 233 and 54 cents. So um, by the way, super quick. Part. It's possible that maybe you had like another cash flow that was there, or maybe you didn't press the correct interest rate. If it doesn't work, just send me a message on Facebook and I'll literally just like send me a video and I'll, you know, I'll check it out for you. So no worries. All right. 
So yeah, that's how you go about it. Now, let me ask you a question. Is the present value of these future cash flows bigger and or smaller than $35 million today? Somebody tell me, is it bigger or smaller? Exactly. It's bigger, 100%. It's definitely bigger. Uh, so, yeah. Huh. yeah, it's, anyways, it's bigger. So your present value of all these future cash flows is bigger. Why? Well, that's because obviously we discounted it at a smaller rate, okay? Yeah, by the way, it's always better to clear before you do that. What I used to do is I just like kind of like do zero for all of them. Anyways, it's a whole different topic. It's always good to make sure that your stuff is cleared out and that everything's good. But what I'd like to say here is that if your present value exactly part, you see, that's why it's always important to clear or kind of like double check and make sure that everything is correct, right? Because obviously CO3 should be set at nothing, right? So that said, our present value of our future cash flows is. $63 million. And obviously that is bigger than the lump sum that's going to be provided to you of $35 million today. And for that reason, you'd obviously want to maybe, you know, maintain those annual payments, right? For those 25 years. So that said, what I'd like y'all to do is I would like y'all to tell me, well, when are you indifferent? When are you indifferent between those two options? And I'm going to give you a quick trick. Okay. I'm going to give you a quick little insight. All right. Obviously, if our interest rate is 2%, our present value is bigger than 35 million. But if our interest rate is 10%, our present value is smaller, okay? It is smaller than 35 million. So probably the interest rate where we are indifferent is between 2% and 10%. You wanna find that point at which you are indifferent, all right? So let me know. You guys will have three minutes to give it a shot, okay? Give it three minutes once again, starting now. Uh, no, I just took a random amount, just to tell you, to clearly show you here that, um, you know, there, there's a range and at a specific point, they're equal the same, right? So in the meantime, I need to adjust myself for that error. For sure, for sure, for sure. Everybody, get, give it a shot. Try to find the answer. And uh, we'll keep it together. All right, so once again, I want you to find the point at which we are totally indifferent. Okay. You guys have one minute and 30 seconds.
All right. So um, I only saw one answer, and I think it was sent to me. So let me ask you, um, how did you all feel about this? Was this difficult? Was this like, was this nuanced? What were um, the, the issues here? Because nobody really found an answer. Okay, how are we feeling? I know we've been going at it for like an hour and a half. So I'm sure some of y'all are tired, which is fair. We could take like a little break after this. We'll do one big question after, so it'll be awesome. And then we'll try to do the equity. But um, how do we feel? Maybe write in the chat, raise your voice. Both options are amazing. How are we feeling? Do we like, was this just like, Joe, I have no clue what to do? Or was it just like, I'm just not trying to do it? What is the answer? Okay, the answer is 7%, is 7.8972%. I'll write it here. I'll show you 7.8972. Like around that end would be a correct answer. Something around here would be a correct answer. Okay, but everybody, what did you get? Like, how are you? It's okay. It's okay to be wrong, by the way. So, um, Vincent, what did you get? How did you feel? If you don't mind me asking, how was it? Like, what's up? And if nobody wants to answer, I'll just show you guys how you could do this. There are three ways about doing this. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll go for it. I'll, I'll let y'all know what I would do, okay? And it's, that's why it's super important in my opinion to really, it's, it's really cool because if you understand stuff, right? If you try to make sense of it, it becomes much easier, okay? It becomes much easier. So let's try to figure it out. All right. So in this case, there are three ways about going about this. And I guess I'll write them right here. So three ways. So there are three ways to solve this. Um, let me just kind of format this. Yeah, so there are three ways to solve this. There's the first one, which is through your calculator, the calculator method. Then there's the formula method. There's the trial method, which is the one I definitely do not recommend. <laughs> okay, that's definitely like the worst option out there. All right, the calculator method is the easiest version. The formula method is easy medium. Okay. And then the trial method is literally the hardest because, I mean, you're literally doing trial and error, okay? So how would we do this on our calculator, all right? How would we do this on our calculator? So what you want to figure out, okay, what you want to figure out is you want to figure out a point, right? And you guys will let me know if this, if this makes sense or no. You want to find out a point at which you're... $3,250,000 that you're receiving every single year for the next 25 years would give you a present value that's equal to $35 million. Is that, is that clear to everybody? Does that make sense that that's our mission here? That's what we're trying to do. Yes or no? Does that make sense? I see one yes. Cool. Okay. That makes sense that we are trying to find a point of interest where our future payments of $3,250,000 for the next 25 years will be equal to $35 million today. In other words, is it, is it fair, okay? Is it fair to say that we definitely know our payment? Do we all know that our payment is $3.25 million? Say no in the chat. <laughs> say no in the chat. Is that, is that something that we all agree? 100%, okay? So we know that our 3.25 million dollars a year is definitely our payment. It's definitely our payment if we want to plug that into our calculator. However, we also know, right, we also know that our present value, right, the money that we want this to be equal to today, we want it to be equal to our present value, our lump sum of $35 million. So would it be fair for me to write $35 million as my present value? Could you say yes or no in the chat? Would that be fair? I need to see a few yeses. I need to see a few no's. 
Okay, so I see two yeses. Georgia says yes as well. Amazing. Okay. Obviously, unfortunately, we don't know our k yet. Okay. And there's definitely no g. There's no growth rate in this question. So we don't care about that. And we know what is our number of periods? For how many years are we looking at this? Charnel says 25. Does somebody like second that? How many periods? Exactly. We're looking at 25 periods. And this is yearly, okay? This is yearly, every single year, okay? So for that reason, once again, we're really solving for our, our K, our interest rate, okay? So if we were to kind of just do the classic game of what do we know and what do we don't know, technically, as I said, we know our present value, we know our payment, and we definitely know our N. One thing that we're not too sure about is our IY, which I'll highlight in, in I guess, yellow. <laughs> we'll highlight that in our yellow, okay? And then in this case, could somebody tell me, what would be our future value? Is there a future value here? What would it be, just for fun? Charnel says zero. Part says zero, one more answer, just for fun. You may be right, exactly. There's no future value here. We're not seeking a specific amount in the future. So in this case, it would be zero. So once again, it seems that the only thing we're solving for is our interest rate. So that's just some cues of what you need to plug in within your formula, I mean, within your calculator. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do exactly that. We're gonna plug in all of those different values and we're gonna see whether it gives us something at the end, okay? All right, we're, we may need to do one small adjustment. I'm kind of ready for it, we'll see, but we should be fine. So. Everybody, could you put your N in your calculator as 25, okay? <laughs> Navier says, got it, amazing. Put N as 25, put your PV as $35 million, put your payment as $3.25 million, put your face value as zero, and then what I need you to do, I'm gonna highlight it here. You're gonna compute, okay, for IY. You're gonna solve for IY. And that should give you the same answer that we got, which was 7.8972%. Now, I need everybody to tell me if you got it or if you did it. I see, it seems like Pacht, uh, Pamver, and Lean got it. I just need a few more answers just for fun to make sure that that works. Um, it's, by the way, it's possible that you may need to put um, like one, uh, one being negative. Okay, that is possible. That's why I said, you know, you may have to make an adjustment. By the way, if it throws an error at you, just put one of them as being negative, okay? So 100%. So could we have treated this as an IRR? Like, I would say no, but we could try it out if you want. But no, because, uh, no, I would say no. My answer would be no. Uh, my answer would be no. But I could try to like thread that idea a little bit and try to find like a good, clear commonality. But I see what you're trying to say, Georgia. Okay, so everybody here, are we okay with the calculator method? Yeah, Georgia, that's why I know it, it could work. That's, uh, I, I know what you did, but I'm not trying to go too far into it. So I want to find like a common like line for everybody here in the chat. But technically, yes, you can. All right. Uh, here, by the way, I mean, what we did here is we just solved for the present value. Okay, what we did just to make it super clear, we knew our present value, we knew the amount already, but we just didn't know what was our K. We didn't know what was our IY, all right? So we just reversed engineer. We didn't do the net present value here, okay? That's very different. Well, not very different, but it's not the case here, okay? What I would like to do right now, just for fun, is just kind of go back to our previous slide, which I believe was this one, okay? And you'll see what I mean in just a sec. If we use this little structure that I have, Okay, and I guess we'll copy it just to make it easier. If we go, if we use our structure, all right, if we use our structure altogether, could somebody tell me, is this a defined or undefined period? Is this a defined set of cash flows or an undefined set of cash flows? Write it in the chat. Charnel says defined. Is it a defined set of cash flows? I need everybody to write it down just to make sure. Okay. Georgia says define, China. exactly. So if we were to use our structure, we would go up like this and boom, we stop here. So we're at a defined period, okay? 
All right, define being 25 years, exactly. Now, are these payments happening at the end of the year or at the beginning of the year? Can somebody tell me? I gave you guys a trick on the first midterm. If nothing is being said, what is it? Tanvir says end. If nothing is said, yes, exactly. If nothing is said in the question, if there's no today, or if there's no at the beginning, you are for sure dealing with something that's happening at the end of the period, okay? Is that clear to everybody that then we know that our payments are happening at the end of the period? So we're moving all the way here onto our timeline. Is that clear to everybody so far? Just quick yes in the chat. Quick yes, just to make sure we're on the same page. Okay, tremendous, amazing, amazing, amazing. And now are these payments defined or are they growing? What's going on here? Are they defined or are they growing? Somebody tell me in the chat. Are they defined or are they growing? Georgia says defined, exactly. So we would go whoop, right here into our structure. Notice how simple and easy it is to kind of do a quick checklist. Okay, so now, are we solving for the present value or are we solving for the future value? Can somebody tell me in the chat? Are we solving for the future? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's epic, okay? So are we solving for the present value or the future value? Which one are we going for? Present value or future value? Somebody tell me, I mean, it should be pretty clear to everybody. Yeah, we're solving for the present value. So we go like this, boop, right there. So now I wanna make some things painfully clear. Notice how we are, and I guess I'll highlight it on both ends. We have our present value here. So in our formula, we could just highlight our present value. That's something we know. We have our payments here. That's something we know, okay? We have our K here, which we do not know yet. So that's a problem. And we have our N here that we do know, okay? Notice how before I said the same thing. In these types of questions, there are really only four things that you need to find as variables. We have them available to us. And all that we need to do now is plug them in. So if you were to use the formula method, you would just solve for K. You would just solve for K. So you would say, okay, $35 million is equal to $3.25 million divided by X multiplied by, in brackets, one minus one over one plus X to the power of 25. You would solve for that. Okay, I'm not going to do it now because I'm using this as my pen. It's just not going to look good. But what I can tell you is that if you are confused and you don't know what to do, it's always good to use the flowchart and make sense of the question. Everybody here is logical, right? Everybody here knows how to solve problems. This is just yet another example of where you could be creative. Okay, and then the trial method. Well, the trial method sucks. It's, uh, it's just you plug in numbers every single time and then you try to find the answer. All right. So that's how you go about finding such an answer, okay? And you do that on an exam, you're doing like super solid, all right? So now, really quickly, um, I'm going to be annoying, and I'm going to throw at you, before we take a break and we do some capital budgeting stuff, I'm going to throw at you a curveball, okay? I want you to just really, you know, I, I like it when you guys try some new stuff. So in this case, I don't even know the answer yet, but we're gonna say that the payments are gonna be five, $5 million, $150,000 a year. And it's gonna be for 35 years, I don't even know. And it's an exchange of a lump sum of, I'm gonna say 500. okay? And then we're also going to say that if the risk-free rate was four and a half percent, what option is the best? So this one's a, a stacked question for sure, a hundred percent, but I'm still going to ask you to give it a shot. And I'm going to give you guys, what time is it? I'm going to give y'all four minutes to give it a shot. Four minutes with all this information, with everything we just saw together, you should have all the tools available under the sun, I think. And myself, you could text me in a little chat and we'll, we'll, we'll conversate in the next four minutes to solve this question, okay? So you have, put it right now, you're gonna have four minutes and 18 seconds to give it a shot. Starting now, then I'm gonna give you guys the quick brief on that. Mm. 
both parts, both parts. I want to know when are you indifferent and what would you do if it's four and a half percent? This was on the exam. It's important for you all to know what to do. Okay. Uh, yeah, please, in the chat. Yes, please, please, please. In the chat for everybody to see. And I get to know whether you did it or not. <clears throat> you guys have two minutes and 50 seconds. Two minutes and 10 seconds. Two minutes and 10 seconds. What is the on? I'm going to give everybody the one minute and a half that's left. In the meantime, I'm also kind of solving for it. Thirty seconds. You guys are pros, man. Perfect. Sorry about that. Okay, so. Let's check it out. Let's check it out. Let's check it out. I'm going to start by the easier part, which is the second uh, portion, which is if Marie considers investing in the risk-free rate at four and a half percent, what would be best? So the could people rewrite in the chat, what is the answer for the second part? If Marie invests in risk-free rate at four and a half percent, which option is best? So it seems like Paramvir says 88 million is bigger than 67 and a half million dollars. So they would say that you would go with um, essentially the NPV, which is in the present value. So let me see if you're correct. And exactly, yeah. So I'm sorry, I'm using another Excel at the same time. I'll kind of copy the sheet here. Give me a second. I'll copy it on our screen. You'll see it in just a second. 
I was solving the question on another, another document. Okay, so there you go. So if we were, just to do the second part together, if we were to have payments of $5 million, 150,000, let me just copy this as well. Oops, sorry about that. Sorry about that, just give me a sec. There you go. If we were to have an annual payment of $5,150,000 a year for the next 35 years, okay? And we had that versus a lump sum of $67,500,000, we would actually rather take our annual payments, right? Because the present value at a rate of four and a half percent is actually $89 million, 924,000, which is obviously bigger than, whoops, than the amount quoted for today. So the second part, is that clear for everybody? Then we're gonna move on to the first part, but everybody seems to have had the right answer. So yeah, hundred percent. So I guess I won't spend too much time. Um, is this clear? Is this question easy? Are we comfortable with this? Do we know what we're doing? Yes or no? Quick yes or no in the chat. Quick yes or no. Is this clear? Do we know what we have to do? Like, is do you guys have any questions? Pretty straightforward. I mean, yeah. I didn't see how many people in the chat had the correct answer. <laughs> and uh, just to double down, it would be if it was 6.88%, it was what, 6.884, something of the sort. You notice how we would be extremely close. So, yes, that would be the answer. So that said, before we take a little break, we're going to take like a little eight minute break so we can breathe and then jump into capital budgeting together. How are we feeling? Do we have any questions? Yes, no. Or are you excited to go take your little eight minute break? <laughs> any questions, any ideas, or are we good for a little eight minute break? No problem, no problem. Okay, so we're good. Okay, amazing. Then we're gonna take a little eight minute break. And as per usual, you could obviously send me a, a question you know, on, on the chat and I'll, I'll be more than happy to answer. Okay, so let's take a quick eight minute break and we'll be right back, okay? And we're gonna go for another like 45 minutes or so if we can we'll try to push through capital budgeting, capital budgeting together. All right, see you in eight minutes.
I had the best sandwich of my life, so I had to finish it. <laughs> but um, all jokes aside, we're going to hop in <clears throat> capital budgeting. And last session, we touched on it a little bit, but I saw some questions in the chat. I feel like because it's the end of the semester and it's an intensive semester and it's part of the later chapters, that is typically something we try to brush, you know, kind of get done with as soon as possible. And that's why, <clears throat> sorry, I took the time to build a comprehensive case. And this case will really be something that's super interactive. We'll, we'll walk through it together. You could, I build it today, you know, there may be some, some nuances that I flew, flew, flew across. So don't hesitate to ask me questions throughout the process. But what this case is meant to do, <clears throat> it's really meant to look at all the different capital budgeting tools available and really give you a better appreciation of what the heck a capital <laughs> budgeting tool is, why it matters, and also what are the differences at play and how can you visualize it and kind of make it a little bit more interactive for you. <clears throat> so this case is really something that we're going to be working together. Okay, we're going to, I'm going to throw a ball at you, you're going to throw a ball at me, and we're going to try to make sense of it as we go. Some portions, I'm going to require you to do some work, just because or else it becomes too easy. And I do want you to, I do want you to kind of know the skills to use on the exam. So without further ado, let's jump into it. As you can see, there's nothing on the screen, really. And that's because I removed everything. And I'm going to kind of do some parts with you, and some of them are going to be required to do. So give me a sec. All right. You'll tell me if the prompt is clear. And if not, we'll try to adjust it. So an investment group called Creative Investments seems to be super interested in the sports industry. So we're talking basketball, soccer, um, American football, cricket, whatever you want to call, okay? And their creative investments, so the company Creative Investments, wants to deploy a large investment in one of the two following mutually exclusive projects, all right? The first one being Montreal's first professional basketball team in the NBA, all right? We could call it the Montreal Buccaneers, I don't know. And then number two, the different project, the other project, would be Quebec City's first professional soccer team in the MLS, all right? So Creative Investments has two projects that they're kind of like struggling to choose from, all right? And because they're struggling to choose from these two projects, the board of directors of Creative Investments are asking you to evaluate these two projects using popular capital budgeting tools. For context, Popular capital budgeting tools are the ones we've seen in class, and this will include the internal rate of return, the net present value, payback period, the discounted payback period, as well as the profitability index. So we're going to be looking at five different capital budgeting tools, and we're going to evaluate really <clears throat> how our decisions will change, what do these, how our decisions will change based on these tools, and why we should be wary of what these tools really mean. So with that said, we're going to look at these two projects. And what I want you to know is that these two projects will require the same initial investment, all right? They require the same amount of money like today. There's just no other way to go about it, all right? And in this case, the same initial investment will be of minus 200,000, uh, 200,000. Uh, am I this way? No, $200 million. <laughs> I'm bad about that. So it'll include, it'll require minus 200 million dollars okay and the company's opportunity cost the company's discount rate the company's interest rate or cost of equity or weighted average cost of capital however you want to call it is going to be five percent all right now as i said there are two projects that we're looking into project a which is montreal's nba team will give you cash flows from year one all the way to year five of 17.5 million dollars okay 17.5 million dollars and then from year six all the way to year 15 okay it'll be 25 million dollars all right this is the time frame that we're looking into now on the other hand 
Project B, Quebec City's first MLS team, first professional soccer team, will give you the following cash flows in three different segments. The first one being your cash flows from year one all the way to year five of $10 million. Then it'll be your cash flows from year six all the way to year 10, which will be of $22.5 million. And the last set of expected cash flows will be from year 11 to year 15, in which you will earn or <clears throat> creative investments will earn $45 million dollars per year once again these are cash flows for year like so every year you're going to get these specific cash flows just to make that clear so these are yearly cash flows just to make this super clear okay so before we proceed do we have any questions is anything unclear just before we proceed quick yes or no if you have a question let me know give you guys like 10 seconds to type it in if there's anything okay so we're all clear all right it seems like it. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to start with Project A. Okay, we're going to start with Project A. And the first thing that I'll do for us, okay, is we're going to look at the cash flows. I guess I can zoom in a little bit more. All right. We're going to begin with this bucket right here, which is Project A's cash flows. All right. I think we could all agree that on the first year, Project A, so today at year zero, Project A is losing $200 million. Is that clear to everybody? Is this something that we could all see and understand? Quick yes or no in the chat. Like this, we're gonna make it interactive. We're working at this together, okay? I'm gonna help you build out the cash flows, build out our timeline. Is this clear for everybody? Yes or no? Are we here? Okay, clear to everybody, amazing. Cool. Lean and me, we're going to work on this together. All right, cool. So with the information provided, what would be our cash flow at year one? Somebody tell me, what would be our cash flow at year one? What would be our cash flow at year one? You, can, you don't need to write the whole thing. You can just write the first section of it. What is the cash flow? Exactly. $17.5 million. And we're going to keep that up until year five. All right, we're going to keep that up until year five. All right. Then starting year six, what is our cash flow? Somebody tell me in the chat, just for fun. We're doing this together. What is our cash flow? Starting year five. I sorry, I'm sorry. Start, starting year six. Sorry. Twenty-five. Thank you so much, Arna and Lean. Thank you. Great stuff. Okay. So this will be our cash flow up until year fifteen, which is great stuff. Great news. Okay. So we have that. That's super awesome. Now, what I'd like to say, and just to give you context, and we're going to start with two things at first. What I'd like to say here is that, obviously, $200 million is a lot of money to invest up front. I think we could all agree that $200 million is a lot of money to invest up front. So I think it's pretty fair if you know the board of directors, yourself, or any rational investor would like to know when am I at least going to recoup all of my money? When am I at least going to have, you know, broken even? Okay. Well, obviously it's going to, it seems like it's going to take some time, right? Because we invested $200 million today. It should probably take some time before we break even. All right. You could actually visualize this with this graph. Okay. They invested $200 million today. And obviously this line is important. So just for you to see, all right, this is $0. Obviously, they invested $200 million at year zero, right, today. So what I'd like to ask you, could you give me a quick rough estimate of when you should be expected to break even? Can somebody tell me? Somebody give me a rough estimate of when you're expected to break even by just looking at this graph. This is a number of years, and then obviously this is money. All right. How many years roughly? Lean says year 10, Georgia, Charnel, Rami, what do y'all think? When are we expected to break even? I'm gonna give you guys 10 more seconds. Exactly. Towards year 10. If anything, it seems like it's gonna be in the middle part of year 10, if anything, right? It's gonna be around 
this ballpark here. We're not too sure where exactly, but it should be within that framework, right? If anything, it should be like between year nine and year 10. That should give, that should be like our indicator here, okay? So that's important for us to know. I mean, that's something that maybe somebody would care about. Imagine you had to make an investment and they tell you, you will only break even a hundred years from now. Would that be an investment that you're totally down for? Probably not. You would rather have an investment where you would probably get your money as fast as possible. Although something subjective, this is still something that may matter. The number of years it would take for you to get your money back. And that's actually called the payback period. <laughs> How much time will it take you to earn your money back, to pay back the money you've invested, okay? So let's try to navigate those waters. Let's try to understand when the hell will you have your money back? Okay, so for us to do this, we could do two things and I'm gonna do it for you just to make it super simple. Obviously, after your investment, you made zero money. And after one year, you made $17.5 million. And after two years, you made $35 million. Is that something that's clear to everybody here? That we could look at our cumulative amount of money we made to then assess when we actually surpassed our $200 million initial investment. Is that a, is that a quick, clear, and easy way to think about it? Yes or no? Okay, cool. Amazing. So I'm going to spare you the, the, you know, the mental dread of doing this for every single year. And I'm going to just copy paste it because I obviously have the solutions. So in this case, you can notice that after three years, you're at 52 million, four years, 70 million. After eight years, you're at 162 million. We're getting closer. And then as we said before, yes, as we said before, between year nine and year 10 seems to be a pretty good point for us to be able to retrieve our money because we are between this threshold of $200 million, all right? Now you could also do it in a different way. You could say that your total earnings, what are earnings, by the way? Earnings is like profit, you do revenue minus cost, in this case, cash flows, minus initial investment, okay? In this case, our earnings at year zero would obviously be minus $200,000. And our total earnings at year one would simply be minus $200,000 plus the money we made at year one. Is that an easy indicator? Is it just a different way to look at it? Is that clear for everybody? Yes or no? I'm going to go with it is clear. All right. Now, obviously, you could do this for every single year. And we would notice as well, as you can see right here, that we are definitely breaking even somewhere between year nine and year 10. Right. We are passing the $200 million threshold of our initial investment between year nine and year 10. That's super important. So with that said, I would like to ask you, well, what is our payback period? How much time does it take for us to make our money back? Can somebody tell me, how much time does it take for us to make our money back? If anything, does somebody in the chat know how to do that? Does somebody in the chat know how to do that? Yes or no? Do you have any clue about how we find our payback period? with the information provided right now. Give you all like 10 seconds, 15 seconds to try to answer a quick yes or no in the chat. Let me ask you another question. Are we tired? How are we feeling? Are we, are we doing okay? Is it a lot? Is your brain tired now or or you just, you know, it's a Friday night, you probably want to be doing something else. I totally get it. How are we feeling? Answer that question for me, please. How are we feeling? That matters to me more. So Georgia says you're doing okay. Okay, that's good. You're overwhelmed. Okay. All right. Overwhelmed by the information, overwhelmed by the studying process. Well, how, how, why are you overwhelmed? If you don't mind me asking, of course, by the way. A lot of material, okay. 
Well, for sure, we looked at literally three different types of topics today since 9, since 9 a.m. Okay, well, listen, would you guys want me to just, um, oh, yeah, yeah, but this, by the way, try now, this is, um, for sure, I'm using Excel, but no matter what, in a question, you would have the same amount of information, right? You would have cash flows that are constant from a period to another, right? And that they can have multiple types of cash flows that are constant from a period to another. And then no matter what, at a certain point, you are going to break even. You want to know what you do when you break even. So what I'm going to propose is, do y'all want me to um, do it myself and maybe ask you to solve like specific little things, like maybe like a little input on your calculator and like that you could kind of rest and maybe even review at the same time. And then when it's, you know, when it comes to moment, we'll, uh, you'll be able to review this thing on your own. So do you guys want me to kind of like run by it, do it quickly and give you the quick insights? And then after that, you review the video. Is that something that works? How are we, because I'm, it's clearly we seem a little bit tired. Yeah? Okay, cool. All right. So what I'll say is that please ask me questions if something's unclear. I'm always going to check up. Like I'm going to check with y'all and see y'all are doing okay. But just let me know if something's like too fast or too unclear or wasn't emphasized on enough. Okay. So. On this table right here, we clearly see the amount of years and we know that between year nine and between year 10, we seem to be breaking even. We seem to be passing the threshold of $200 million, which is our initial investment. But how do we find the specific you know, time at which we did break even? Because as we can see right here, it definitely is between year nine and year 10. It has to be between the two periods, okay? And what's even more interesting is that we know that in terms of total cash flows, at year nine, we had $187 million and 500,000. At year 10, we had $212,500,000. So it's really interesting. We clearly know that our cash flows increased by $25 million, okay? There is also a very easy way to find this insight by simply looking at your cash flows. You know your cash flows no matter what, it was given to you in the question. So you know that every single year, you will be making $25 million in cash flows per year starting year six. So that's something that should be obvious. That's something that is in French called an évidence, all right? So what you wanna know, what you wanna do because you are rational, you know, sharp, you clearly know that from year nine, you had $187.5 million, okay? And your goal is to get to $200 million. That's what you wanna to get to. You wanna to get to the amount of $200 million. You may ask, why do I even wanna get there? Well, you wanna get there because that's your initial investment. You wanna be able to say that you are breaking even, all right, BE for breaking even. So I'm gonna ask you all quickly in the chat, how much money are we missing to break even? How much money are we missing to break even? Super quick, how much money are we missing to break even? I'm, I'm doing a new trick. I'm giving you all 10 seconds every time I ask a question and if not, I answer. So. Three, two, one. Okay. Well, in this case, simply by doing 200 minus 187 and a half, you would get 12 and a half, right? $12.5 million is what we're missing between our 187.5 million and our $200 million, right? We want to see how much are we missing to get to that amount, okay? And assuming that our cash flows are evenly distributed every single day or every single month or every single you know, week or whatever the case may be, we would say that, well, technically, we only need $12.5 million of our cash flow on year 10. In other words, we would only need $12.5 million of $25 million 
to break even, right? So we technically would need only half of that to break even. We would need one over two, or in other words, 0.5, right? So what we do here, when we're looking at the payback period, or if we're looking at the discounted payback period, all that we try to assume is two things. One, that time and cash flows are evenly distributed, that every single day you will make the same amount of money, just to make it simple for you. Such that with that assumption, you could say that the difference between the previous year's cash flows and um, the goal of your cash flows, you just need to do a division of the two to find what proportion of time was allocated to reach that specific goal. In this case, 50% of the total cash flows made this year is needed to attain our goal of $200 million. Therefore, you would simply do, right? You would simply do 0.5 plus nine years, and that would give you 9.5 years, right? It would take you nine and a half years to make your money back. It would take you nine and a half years to make your money back. Super cool. Nine and a half years to make your money back. That's an amazing answer and insight. Now, I'm going to ask you super quickly, well, that's our payback period, OK? But what if we're looking at our discounted payback period? What the hell? No, 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 you don't. No, 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 no. EA and PV is simply when you have two mutually exclusive projects with different timelines, OK? And in this case, by the way, Georgia, we didn't even talk about net present value yet. I was simply only looking at one specific capital budgeting tool, which was the payback period, right? It's totally fair to ask somebody, well, when would you want to get your money back, right? When would you want to get it back? And in this case, it's going to be taking you nine and a half years. EA and PV in this specific question is not required. We have two mutually exclusive projects, project A and project B, and they have the same length in time, which is 15 years. EA and PV, once again, only happens when you have mutually exclusive projects, if I'm not mistaken, who are in different lengths in time. If you look at our study guide and you look at the crash, final crash course from previous semesters, we actually cover that question and we have three projects that we're looking into and we find which one's the best based on our EA and PV because that helps us make our decision, all right? That said, that said, what if we looked at our discounted cash flows, right? Before we said that, you know, money tomorrow may not be as valuable as money today, right? That's something that we all understood. We talked about it so many times today. So what if we, you know, the board of directors at, uh, I believe it was what, creative investments say, you know what, I get that. I understand our payback period is of nine and a half years, but we need to assess for our opportunity costs. We need to assess, you know, for this idea of time value of money. So what would you do then? You would literally just simply, as we always do, discount every single cash flows one by one to be able to find your discounted payback period. Now, obviously on an exam, they're not gonna ask you to do that. And if they do, it's gonna be only for three years. So what I'm gonna do for you is I'm gonna make this easy. I'm gonna give you all the discounted cash flows in this example, which is at the rate, I believe of 5%. And I'm gonna ask you to tell, I'm gonna ask you, and you're gonna tell me, what is our discounted payback period? Okay, what is our discounted payback period? I want y'all to tell me, what is our discounted payback period? Okay, knowing everything that I've written, that I've written on the screen, all right? And I'll do a few things, give me a sec. You'll have all the info you need to solve this. Right. You'll have all the info you need. So with this information, I'll even do this. I'll even help you out. All right, I'll even help you out. This is what you'll probably see along an exam, all right? You notice that it seems like we're passing our $200 million threshold between year 12 and year 13, okay? Can somebody tell me, what would be our discounted payback period? 
what would be your discounted payback period? I'll give y'all two minutes to give it a shot. A minute and a half. If that doesn't work, I'll do it myself. Yeah, one more minute. One more minute. I'll start doing it. So in this case, we know we're missing 10,889,784 dollars to reach our goal of 200 million dollars, which is to break even, okay? To break even. And we also know, right, that our cash flow for that this for that year that is discounted is 13 million 258 thousand and thirty four so if we know that we're okay sure 100 percent. so that's why I'm, I'm showing it to you right now so we know that we're missing 10 million dollars right about which is this amount to reach our break-even point to reach minus 200 million right to, to to essentially break even and we also know but our cash flow for year 13 is 13,258,034. So what you would do is you would say, well, assuming that the cash flows are evenly distributed throughout the year, you would simply do 10,889,784 divided by 13,258,034. And that would give you your proportion. That would give you how much time for that year, for year 12 to year 13 that you would need to get to breaking even to meet your goal of $200 million. So can somebody tell me what is this amount? This divided by this plus 12, what would that give you? What would that give you? Plus 12, what would that give you? I mean, Charnel, what did that give you? Uh, let me ask you this. What did that give you? What like percentage did that give you? Tell me. Well, but oh, you looked into the solutions. But what did it give you? Tell me. Just just for fun. Let's let's entertain it. Because technically. Okay. So let's. Let's, let's, let's try to be logical here. Let's, let's try to apply some sort of like basic logic, all right? And I'll erase this stuff and we'll, we'll go through it again. It's totally fine. So let's say, let's say that you know for sure that it's probably between year 12 and year 13. The reason why is because clearly at year 13, you're at $202 million. So for sure it can't be after year 13, so it has to be before it has to be between 12 and 13. So far, is that a clear insight to everybody here? So far, is that a clear insight? This yes or no? This is super clear, yes and or no. Okay, 100 percent So we know it's between 12 and 13. That's super, super duper fair. So what do we do then? So what we did, and I'll I'll kind of talk about Charnel's version, right? What Charnel did is, and you'll tell me if I'm right, you did this number minus this number divided by this number. Is that true? Is that what you did in the chat, if I'm not mistaken? Tell me yes or no in the chat. Did you do that? 
Yeah, that's what you did. Okay. So what you did is exactly what I said right here. Okay. You found the difference between year 13 and year 12. And it gave you $10,889,784, which is exactly my numerator here. Then you divided it by the number, by the total amount of money you made on year 13, right? That's exactly what you did. And it gave you a percentage, it gave you a specific percentage. Did it not turn out? Did it give you an amount? Yes or no? What did it give you? Can you write in the chat? What was that amount? But what's the, just give me the numbers. That's all I'm asking you. Uh, it's okay to, to, to be wrong. I'm, actually, I don't think you're wrong. So you're telling me that $202,000 minus 189, like 202 million minus 189 million gave you, and that divided by 13 million, that gave you 13? Oh, you did the opposite. Because in the chat, you did the right thing. So in the chat, you wrote the right thing. That's why I'm confused. Okay. Well, in the chat, you wrote the right thing. <laughs> anyway, the idea here, the idea here though, all right, the idea here is simply, you wanna find what proportion of the time between year 12 and year 13 was allocated, right, to our missing amount of 10,889,784. All right, and that's gonna give you the percentage of 82%, 137, all right? That's gonna give you that amount. And all that you need to do now is do 12 plus that amount. It's gonna give you 12.82137 and purely numerical values, purely numerical numbers. All right. So that said, now we have our payback periods. Okay, now we have our payback periods. All right, so the only one we're gonna do, we're gonna do project A together, and then I'll do project B on my own. I'll get you all the numbers out, and then I'm just gonna look at the crossover rate with you, which is simple and easy. From there, we'll be done. So don't you worry. Okay, so now the last thing. Not even the last thing. One other thing that I'd like you to do is I'd like you to plug these cash flows in your calculator, and I want you to find the net present value if the discount rate is 5%. Right? So if you remember what we did before, if you remember what we did before, we took a calculator, all right? We used that, and then we highlighted what to do. So you're going to go in CF, you're going to place your first one, CO0, as minus $200 million. Then you're going to press Enter. And after that, you're going to do $17.5 million. Okay? You're going to do that amount. You're going to press Enter. You're going to do arrow down. You're going to put your frequency as being, in this case, 5. You're going to put 5. Then you're going to press Enter again. Once you've done that, okay, once you've done that, what you're gonna do is you're gonna place in $25 million. You're gonna do enter, arrow down. You're gonna place your N as being equal to 10. You're gonna do enter, arrow down. Then just verify to see that all of your arrows are good, that everything is well. Once you've done that, you're gonna go select NPV. You're gonna write your I as being equal to five. You're gonna enter that. Once you've done that, you're going to compute for our NPV. And I want you to tell me, what is our NPV? I need Georgia, Lean, Charnel, every single one of y'all to try. And if you don't get it, it's OK. I'm going to tell you exactly what you need to do to get it. So don't you worry. All right? Georgia has an answer. Amazing. OK, what about Lean and Charnel? What you got? That's, that's fine. You, maybe you're right. Who knows? All right. What about Lean and Charnel? What y'all got? What do you got? I need you. I really need you girls to try it out. 
And yeah, 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 totally, totally. Okay. So you press, oh, I guess that's on me. I just want you to do arrow down. All right. Once you're on NPV and it shows you I here, you're going to write down your I, which is a 5%. You're going to do enter. Then arrow down is going to show you NPV right here. Then you're going to press compute. Okay. No problem. That's, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. What do, you, what do you get? Amazing. Now, Charnel, what do you got? And it, is there like any nuances, things that didn't work out? Let me know. We're literally only us, us three. Well, I guess us four. Okay. So we got this beautiful amount right here. I don't know why I keep something in the draw. There we go. Give me a sec. I don't know why my stuff doesn't want to collaborate. There you go. Wow. Okay. Sorry about that. My computer is just not having it. So we got this amount, which is amazing. All right. We got this amount, which is totally solid stuff. So we got 27. No, there's not. Unfortunately, there's no such thing. But what's really good, Georgia, is that on an exam, you won't have like 20 million different cash flows. They're going to give you the differences. Okay. All right. And if you looked at the study guide, there's actually a few questions on that. So you just got to follow through on that end. Okay. It's, there's no way to do it through a calculator, but there's ways to kind of make it easier for you and quicker for you. This is simply a thing that I would probably recommend maybe trying this question again. Or trying similar questions in the morning, first thing you do, because that's when you're going to be the most creative and the most aware and the most ready to solve a big problem. Trust me, you'll never find this difficult ever again. All right. Now, what I want to need you all to do is now instead of solving for the NPV, I want to ask you to solve for the IRR. So all you got to do is press IRR, then do compute IRR. I want you to tell me what you got. I want you to tell me what you got. Okay. I want you to tell me what you got. Georgia says 6.77. Lean says 6.77. I need one more answer. Charnel, what do you got? What do you got? Amazing. Good stuff. Listen, you'd be surprised. These are things that you're going to have to do on an exam. Now, in this case, it's slightly nuanced. Um, it's like this. There you go. A small rounding error is totally fine. So now, we have four of our different, you know, capital budgeting uh, tools that we need to, you know, use to make an assessment on a project. We're going to look at the last one, okay? We're going to look at the last one together, which is the profitability index. The profitability index is the easiest one, and if you see this on an exam, you say, thank you, Lord, because it's so easy. What you do is simply... The present value of your, if I can do some quick math, of your cash inflows over the present value of your cash outflows. You literally want to see how profitable are you, right? How much money are you making? So in this case, what you would do, and another really good rule, typically in these questions, this right here will always be equal to your initial investment of minus $200 million. Like of whatever your initial investment is, it's typically what you're going to find in your denominator. It's already there. That's mad easy. All you got to do is minus 200 million, or not even minus, sorry about that, just 200 million. That's all you need. And at the numerator at the top is the present value of your cash inflows. So simply, all that you got to do is find the present value, which we already did, of all these different cash flows that you're going to be receiving from years one all the way to year 15. Don't forget, cash inflows is not cash outflows. And that's why I'm not adding minus 200,000, 200, minus 200 million, because that's not it. All right. So what you need to do is just sum all of these together. Now, obviously, I'm not going to ask you to do that right now, because that's a big, big, big number. But what I will do is I'll, I will show them up on the screen, and I will ask you to solve it for me. So this is our present value of all, I guess it's right here too. Well, this is the present value of all of our cash inflows. So present value, cash inflows. Then this is cash outflows. 
which is negative. Now I'm going to ask you to tell me what is our profitability index in this case? What is our profitability index? So 227 million, 20,376 divided by $200 million. What would that be? That's going to give us our PI, i.e. our profitability index. That's going to be our profitability, our, our profitability index. We're almost done. You got this. Another like 10 to 15 minutes and you get to go to bed or go out or chill, whatever works for you. So Charnel says 1.135, exactly lean. And I'm assuming, Georgia, you also have the answer. So yes, that is exactly it. That is exactly it. That is the correct answer. So that's our profitability index. Okay, super solid. So I'd like to share a few points before you move on. What we did here, right? What you do in corporate finance, in a company, and ideally for yourself as well, is before you make an investment, before you make a purchase, you need to kind of assess this decision. You need to evaluate whether it's worth it or not. And in this case, when we're in corporate finance, we could look at really five key indicators, which would be our net present value, our internal rate of return, our payback period, our discounted payback period, and our profitability index. Just to give you a quick insight on all five of these, so you know what to look for when you're doing such a question. The net present value. In a world is, you know, I mean, net present value, what you want simply is that you want your NPV to be bigger than zero, okay? That's super important. In other words, you want your initial investment, okay, to be smaller than the future discounted cash flows you are expecting on this project. That's what the net present value is all about. That's what it's showcasing, right? Once again, in life, there's this opportunity to invest if you're irrational. So you want to take that into consideration when you are investing into projects. Is it an absolute measure? Not necessarily, but trust me, it'll be important towards a later part of this chapter, of this problem, in fact. Our internal rate of return. Our internal rate of return is super interesting because it's a specific discount rate. It's a discount rate at which our NPV is equal to zero. Okay. Why does that matter? Why do we care about such a point? Well, our NPV when it's zero, it's literally the perfect, uh, perfect, like sign in the sand or like line in the sand where you know whether a project is a good project. No, 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 Georgia. It's literally just the, the present value of your cash, of your cash flows. So it's literally the discounted cash flows, every single one of them, right? In this case, it was, we had this cash flow in year one, we discounted it, right? At 5%, it gives us 16.6 .6 million. Same thing for year two, it gave us 15.8 million, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So then you have your discounted cash flows for every single year from year one, all the way to year 15. Those are your discounted cash flows, every single one. Then you need to add them together to find the present value of your future cash flows. In other words, you add all of your present value, all of your discounted cash flows together, and that's going to be your numerator. Okay. That's what it means your present value of your cash inflows. In other words, the present value of the money you're going to be receiving in the future. All right. So, to go back to the internal rate of return. The internal rate of return is giving you, it's a specific interest rate that gives you the point at which your NPV is equal to zero. That's an important, important like line in the sand because any point above your internal rate of return is gonna give you an NPV that is gonna be smaller than zero. Why is that? Well, because this is telling you that your project is the best project for anything that is below the point of 6.78%. But any other project, any other investment, any other thing in the world, right? Okay, any other discount rate, any other opportunity cost that you take beyond the point of 6.78 is a better project to take. So you should not do the specific project that which we're looking at. In other words, we should not be looking at project A. So what I want to do is I'm gonna run a quick game with you. Very quick, very easy. And I'm, I'm going to try to trick y'all real quick. If our discount rate is 0%, what will be um, our present value? Like our net present value. What do you think? 
Do you have an idea? Do you think? Actually, I think it's a hard question. But the net present value would then be 137 million 500. Okay. What the hell is that point? Why is it that amount? Well, this amount is simply the sum of all of our cash flows that are not discounted. So you do 17.5 million times five plus 25 million times 10. All right, something along those lines. And that would give you this specific amount if I know how to do math. Exactly, that's if I know how to do math, okay? So that would be your amount, all right? That should be pretty clear, I just wanna make sure. Okay, cool. So that would be your net present value. Obviously that is bigger, right? Then $27 million. Is that clear to everybody that it is way bigger than $27 million? Is that clear to everyone here? Quick yes, quick no. We're almost done. You got this. We're literally at the end of the, of the race. Now we're sprinting with the active acid in our legs. We're like, oh my God, we want to finish. But uh, yeah, okay. Well, what happens if our discount rate was 10%? Now our NPV is equal to 30 minus $38 million, okay? What happens if we place our discount rate as being equal to our IRR? What will happen if I put that? If I put my IRR as my discount rate, what will be my NPV? What would it be? 10, zero, million? What will be our NPV if we place the IRR as our discount rate? This I need you to answer. I just know another way to go about it. I need you to answer this question. If I place my IRR as my discount rate, what will happen to my NPV? Will it be a positive number, a negative number, zero, infinity, minus infinity? What is it? Lean, Georgia, Charnel, what is the answer? What are we looking at? What is the answer? I'm not going to move forward until we get this because this is important. This is just no problem. If we place our discount rate as being 6.78, i.e. the IRR, what will be our NPV? If I take this amount right here and I put it as my discount rate, what will be my NPV? This we should know. I literally spoke about it like for two minutes. Exactly, it will be zero, 100%, right? Because that's the point at which our then present value would be equal to zero. What I did is I took the liberty just to showcase a few things. All right. What I did here is I just highlighted a bunch of different discount rates that we could have used. Okay. And notice how between 6% and 7%, right? So in other words, between, at a certain point, we pass our IRR. And as soon as we pass our IRR, our NPV starts to become equal to zero, right? But anything below our IRR or NPV gets closer and closer to a bigger amount. That's why the internal rate of return, in other words, the IRR is such an important topic because once again, it really is the line in the sand that, def that alienates when our project will be profitable for us versus the times where our projects will not be profitable for us. And this is something to maybe write on paper, okay? If your K, if your interest rate, your discount rate, or your opportunity cost is bigger than the internal rate of return, all right? Your NPV will be negative because you should, you're probably better off investing in something else than project A. If our K, discount rate, opportunity cost, interest rate, whatever you want to call it, was smaller than our internal rate of return of 6.78%, then we are better off maintaining project A because we are definitely maximizing our investing opportunities. All right? So that's just a very important thing to understand. To move on to our third point really quickly, our payback period, we talked about it, is the point at which you are breaking even. 
your discounted payback period is literally the point where you are breaking even with your discounted cash flows. Obviously, if you discount your cash flows, the cash flows will be worth less. They will be smaller amounts. Therefore, it's going to take you more time to be able to recoup your money, to pay back your investment. Your profitability index is just assessing to what multiple are you making more money than your original investment. It's as simple as that. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to quickly plug in all the data and all the values for project B. And we're going to move on quickly to this idea of the incremental cash flow. If you are tired and you want to leave, it's totally fair because it is eight o'clock, but this will be in our recording still. So don't you worry about it. That's why I'm, I'm going at it because I just want to make sure that this will be done uh, in the right way afterwards. All right. So here, obviously, I plugged in all of our data for project B. You don't need to remember what, they, what it was, but a few things to understand is that we have our cash flows year to year, year to year. We can highlight the point at which it seems like we are starting to break even. In this case, in this case, it seems to be between year 10 and year 11. Notice how that's longer than project A. All right? So that's super important. This means that our payback period for project B seems to be 10, whoops, 10.8 years. Okay? However, for our discounted cash flows, we discounted them as well at 5%, okay? And it gave us smaller amounts, of course, than our normal cash flows. Now we notice that it takes a little bit more time, once again, obviously, because our cash flows are worth less, to break even. In this case, it's between year 13 and year 14. I'm not going to go ahead and use a formula again. We spent so much time on that, but we, we understand it's going to take about 13.22 years to be able to recoup our money okay super duper crucial now i'm going to throw at you a, some quick questions really easy really really quickly um just to see that you're on the same page so which one has a has a bigger net present value project a or project b which one has the bigger net present value project a project b 100 percent which one has the bigger IRR, Project B or Project A? Quickly in the chat. Exactly. Now, which project has the bigger, has the best payback period? Which project has the best payback period? Project A or Project B, the best one? Which one gives you the best payback period? Which one are you happier? Which one are you happiest you know, with, I guess? Which one is giving you the best payback period? Which one is giving you, like, this should be pretty clear. Yeah, exactly. A, because it's smaller. Obviously, you're not going to say B, why would you wait more for your money, right? And just this little silo. All right. Which project gives you the best discounted payback period? Project A or Project B? Okay, we're seeing where like, we're, we understand the mechanism at this point. Okay, what project is giving you the best profitability index? Project A or Project B? Project A or Project B? Exactly, Project B. Thank you so much for participating. This is amazing, okay? So we understand that. A few little pointers here, a few little pointers. Clearly, it's not as black and white as we thought to evaluate a project. Based on the capital budgeting tools that we use, we will have different decisions being made, which says two things. One, it's never good to make a very specific decision because being that narrow, being so focused on one metric, maybe will kind of make you disillusioned because you won't be considering the big picture, all right? And that's why the board of directors in this specific you know, question in cre for creative uh, investments, they should be able to look at every single metric and really understand what's the best you know, perspective. That's just a little point to give you. Now, we're, we're OCDs, okay? We're like totally OCD. And let me just, I guess, whatever, it's fine. I guess we'll put this as well. What I'd like you to do, okay, is I'd like you, we, we could actually do something together, actually. We could look at our incremental cash flows. 
we can look at, well, what if we want to know when is project A a better is better than project B? And when is project B better than project A? So if you guys remember what we did in the last sessions, if you girls, I'm sorry, remember what we did in the last sessions, um, we use what we call is the the I guess the process of incremental cash flows, where we find a difference between these two projects' cash flows on a year-to-year -year basis, and then we discount them, right? Or we solve to find their IRR, because that's going to give us what we call is our crossover rate, the point at which these two projects have the same NPV, right? Because if we subtract their two cash flows, it's like setting this left-hand side of our equation as being equal to zero. You don't need to understand the whole mathematics behind it. What you want to know is that whenever we subtract the cash flows of one project to another, and then we solve for the IRR, we would be able to earn what we call is our incremental cash flow and our essentially crossover rate. So what I'll do is, once again, I'll populate all the differences between project A and B. And on an exam, you would naturally get your discounted cash flows. You wouldn't have to do that, but that's what would happen. And now I'm going to ask you, with this information here, okay, with this information that I'll bold right now, okay, with this information, can you tell me what would be our crossover rate? What would be our crossover rate? Now, you should know how to do this. You should use your calculator, okay? That's what I'm, that's what I'm going to say. Use your calculator. Use a specific function that we looked at so many times today. And tell me what will be our internal rate of return. In other words, what will be our crossover rate? What will be the point at which these different cash flows will have a NPV of zero? In other words, where these two cash flows will have no differences, i.e., it will be equal to zero, i.e., will be the point at which project A and project B are crossing over. So, can somebody tell me what is the IRR of this little subset here? <laughs> Be confident in your answer, Georgia. Be confident. There's no reason why you wouldn't have the right answer. One, because you're good. Two, because the, you have a calculator doing it for you. Lean and try now. What you got? You just got to plug this in into a calculator. That's all I'm going to say. Got to plug this in into a calculator. We've done a few questions like this. What would be our IRR? What would be our IRR? Like a pirate R. Nice. Okay, cool. So the jig is up. We got the answers. All right. That's amazing. We get 8.08%. Now, can somebody tell me what is this? What is what is so important about this number? Is this our crossover rate? Yes or no? Is this our intersection point? Yes or no? If we're looking at you know the chart, okay. amazing. So, on an exam though, on an exam, you're gonna have to be creative, and this is what we did in a few sessions, you know, one on one or in our previous session. Is you're gonna have to plot, okay, this famous line. Oh yeah, 100%. So uh, Charnel, all that you do is you plug in these numbers into your calculator. So zero for CO0, I guess I'll write it down here. Check this out. This is CO0 or CF0. This is CO1, CO2, CO3, and so forth. Now, obviously these ones are the same. So that's one year, two year, three year, four year, five years. So you could put the frequency as being five. Then these ones are also the same. So for five years as well. So you can put the frequency as five and put this as your CO2. And then these ones are also the same. So you can put your frequency as five. And this would be your CO3. Then you just want to clear for everything. You just want to make sure that your data is right. And you would use the IRR function. So you just do press IRR and do compute plus IRR. And that would give you the correct answer. So just to be clear again, CF0 would be 0. CO1 would be 
Oh, see, there you go. It's, but that's why it's so important to double check. Me on my exam, I double check three times. I don't play around. I'm not trying to get a mistake, all right? Always important to double check and to have a timeline in front of you. But what I will kind of work on right now is just simply, and we're, by the way, we're literally done in like four minutes. It's, um, check this out. If y'all remember this, uh, when you want to look at the crossover rate, right? You're going to have your interest rates on the horizontal axis, and you're going to have your NPV on the vertical axis. But you want to be able to plot this out, right? The crossover rate is really important because it tells you when their NPVs are equal to zero. However, that may not necessarily be the case beforehand, and it may not necessarily be the case afterwards. So we want to kind of plot different points on this graph to optimize our chances to find the ranges at which the NPV of one project is bigger than the NPV of another project. This is once again, an amazing tool for us to decide whether project A or project B is a better project. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit more afterwards if you have the time and you care. So let me ask you a few questions. What are points that we for sure know on this graph? If you guys remember what we did last time, what are points that we for sure know on this graph? What are points that are for sure we know? with all the different pieces of information we got. What are points that we know? Yeah, we know the NPV for project A and project B. That's good stuff. I'm cool with that. We know that. OK, we know the NPV. So we know what happens if our point is at, like, call it, I don't know, 5%. That's an amazing, amazing, amazing like answer. I love that. OK, we know that lean. That's solid. You're on the right track. You're doing amazing. What else do we know? That's an amazing answer. I'm very proud. <laughs> That's super solid. Yeah, exactly. We know the IRR for both. You're killing it. Amazing. OK. So the IRR is going to be, if I'm not mistaken, 7, 0 0.3, and 6.78. So we could say 6.78 here. We could say 7.03. OK. And then we could say here, I guess, we have our little intersection, All right? So we have these different points, OK? And the last set of information that I think is super crucial for us, if you were on an exam, is to find, well, what, 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 is our NPVs when our N, what is our NPV when our K is equal to 0? Remember what we did? Because it's hard to kind of plot a graph if you don't know what's the intercept. So if you know that your intercept happens when K is equal to 0, you'll be getting a better view of your graph. OK, I think that's a pretty fair statement. So by the way, for you all to understand, what are the points that hit you know, the intercept when k is equal to 0? All that you have to do is sum their cash flows. So you literally just add all of these together. And that's going to give you your value for NPV when k is equal to 0. OK? So you would get the points here. You would get, yes, exactly, Georgia, exactly. And you would get like another point here. Now on an exam, you would obviously like kind of touch them together like this type of thing. And then you would get your answer type of thing, you know, do something like that. But because, you know, I'm an Excel junkie for some reason, I don't know why I have some sort of pride with this. I obviously made a graph for you for you to be able to visualize what you need to do. But on the exam, by the way, you would just say, OK, well, hey, from here to here, it seems like A is bigger. Then you would say, for example, from here to here, it seems like B is bigger. And that's how you would make a decision on your exam. But let's go a little bit further, all right? What Lean and all of you just said were a bunch of amazing points. And you could actually just write them down like this. OK, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit because I don't want you to see the graphs yet. So on an exam, what would I really care if I were you is I would care about the points. OK, this is important. I would write this on my formula sheet. I would care about the points at which my discount rate is equal to 0%. Because that would be my intercept, by the way, if we use this line. That would be my two intercepts. So I would care about those points like, like for sure, OK, for project A and project B. Then. I would care about, obviously, the IRR. 
So you'd have IRR for A and you'd have IRR for B. These are important points. These would be points along the horizontal axis, right? Super important. Then if you can, not if you can, you need to, <laughs> you need to find this, is gonna be your crossover rate. Very important. So you could say A minus B, for example. And that's typically gonna be in between the two, somewhere here. And then you would say, okay, well, from this range to this range, A is a better project. From this range to the other range, B is a better project. The other points here are not crucial. I just use them to really give you a good vis visualization of the project. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna move this here and we're gonna look at the first graph, okay? So as you can see, if I zoom up a little bit more, I guess I'll zoom up a little bit more. So as you can see here, we have our graph. And I guess I'll have to zoom in, zoom out more. As you can see here, this is how your graph would probably look on an exam. You would look, you would find your, your intersection point at the intercept right here. You'd see where you hit the line here for your IRR. Then you would notice that the intercept is right here and you could evaluate what project is better. So in this case, we notice here that there's a difference between project B and project A. And then if we go right here, we notice that project A is bigger than project B, okay? I further visualize this with, uh, I further visualize this with this little graph here in which the shaded areas represent the points at which B is better than A and the points at which A is better than B. So that's how you would go about it. Now, what I'd like to share just in terms of our question is obviously B overall seems to be a better project just in terms of NPVs, right? For sure, A is bigger than B at a certain point, but it's when our NPVs are negative. I don't know about you, but I'm not trying to have a project that has an NPV that is negative. So that's a very good perspective to have. So finally, the last but not least, it's kind of just the classic so what. Okay, if you guys ever want to, you know, work in, I wonder if you guys are going to start to work. Uh, yeah, for sure it is, for sure it is. Yeah, 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 no, for sure, for sure. This is the crossover rate right here. Uh, sorry, I'll, uh, I'll put it in black, my bad. So. Uh, I don't know why it's not filling up there, but it should work. So yeah, this is our crossover rate right here. It's just below. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, totally, totally. I don't know why it didn't populate, but yeah, 100%. And then I, I don't get it on the exam. Are we supposed to draw a graph? So on the exam, you're going to have the information. They're going to tell you, hey, here's our IRR, all right? for both projects, and here's the cash flows for both projects. With that, they're gonna ask you, when is one project giving you a higher NPV than the other, okay? You need to figure out what is the answer. And the best way to go about it is to use a graph because the shaded area, as you can see, will tell you whether a project is better than another. Why try to do some weird computations and waste your time when you quickly just plot, as you can see, four points on a graph, solve for one simple intersection, and you get your answer. A question that will take students 10 minutes will take you maybe three to four minutes. Okay, so that's why you would want to uh, find a crossover rate uh, in this fashion. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is simply kind of do the classic so what? Why do we care about this for you know creative investments? What will they do with all this information? So whenever they ask you, okay, I think it's a good question as well. Whenever they, whenever they ask you the simple following things, if they ask you, when is a project better than another and they throw at you some IRRs or they throw at you some incremental cash flows, it's probably gonna be the point where you need to find 
not even that. I'm sorry, I'm I'm rambling. But listen, in a question, they will tell you when is a project better than another, right? When a, when does a project have a higher NPV than another? Now you could do this in a bunch of different ways, right? You could do trial and error and find every single NPVs along the way, or you could do it through um, intervals like NPVs for uh, what's the NPV of both projects if their discount rate is from zero to five percent and so on and so forth. But that is not fine tuned. That is not the exact answer. On the exam, they will ask you the exact percentage of K at which those two projects are equal to zero, their NPVs. Then they're gonna ask you, because of that point, before that, what is the best project? And after that point, which one is the best project? So on an exam, they're gonna ask you, hey, when is project A giving you a better NPV than project B? Tell me the exact point where. It'll be as simple as that. It can be through a multiple choice. We're going to give you a bunch of different answers where, for example, the answer says project A gives you a better NPV from 0% to 4%. And then another multiple choice will say project, uh, I don't know, the second option would say project A gives you a better NPV from 2 to 8% and so on and so forth. Those are the questions where you're going to kind of be requested to do so. And in the meantime, we could also try to find um, an example. Give me a sec. That tells you what to do here. So I feel like I was talking so much that uh, what I said didn't even matter anymore. So let me see. Yeah, I got an example for you. So just give me a second. I'm going to copy paste it onto our screen. So this is on my website, by the way, but this is a classic, 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 classic example of what you could see on the exam where they gave you two mutually exclusive projects with two different cash flows, right? And they're like, hey man, the IRR for one project is X, the IRR for another project is Y, okay? And we want you to tell me, when does project B have a higher NPV than project A? The easiest way of going about it is by following this step. Because all you need to do is plot one, two, three, four lines onto a graph, and you get your answer. It doesn't get as easier as that. So this would be a specific question where you would need to do this. So I hope I answered your question. But to go and close this case study, obviously, what we've noticed here is that depending on the capital budgeting tool we use, we may do a decision that's different than the one that we would have done with a different capital budgeting tool. That's the power and that's the weakness of these different tools, right? Because it's never as you know binary as we would think. It's never as clear cut as we think. There is a gray area. And that's why we need to use as many capital budgeting, budgeting tools as we can to form our answer. Because depending on the scenario we're in, right? depending on the type of project we're looking into, depending on the investors that we're dealing with, the decision we'll have to make based on our capital budgeting tools will differ. Because what if we're investing in a, I don't know, in a tunnel? What if we're investing on a new bridge? Obviously these are heavy, heavy, heavy investments with a lot of capital being drawn into them. We're talking like billions or like, like high millions, right? Obviously it's gonna take a lot of time for you to recoup your money. However, this does not mean that the IRR or the net present value is negative or bad. So that's why you need to apply some nuances. And in the exam, if they ask you to say, you know, one decision is better than the other for whatever reason, well, maybe the multiple choice is gonna to try to trick you. So try to be nuanced as much as you can. So yeah, it's been three hours. I know that all of you are exhausted and probably don't wanna hear me talk anymore. But before we go, do you have any questions, any fears, any concerns, any, any what's up? Like, how are we feeling? How are we feeling overall? Was this at least helpful, you know? Always important to see. Okay. Well, if you have questions, now's the time. What's up, Trono? Or like, can you go back to the graph at the end? Like the decision thingy? Yeah, yeah for sure. But the table side. Yeah. So for example, like if we have a question that asks like which project should the firm invest? Basically by this, if I 
understand this graph correctly, if the payback period is bigger in one, pro like for example, if the payback, because the payback period is bigger in project B than project A, then we would choose, oh, sorry, my best. Because the project period is smaller in project A than project B, then we should choose project A. So exactly, on the exams, what they'll do, they'll focus in on one capital budgeting tool. They'll say, hey, based on this, right? Based on this capital budgeting tool, this specific one, what is your decision? So this little graph or table, what, is, what it does is telling you, hey, based on the different capital budgeting tools that we used, we would have different you know, decisions to be made. In, in the case of the payback period, we would choose project A because it's obviously smaller than project B. If it was according to the IRR, we would choose project B because it's giving you a higher IRR than project A. On an exam, it won't be as you know, comprehensive. It'll be based on one specific capital budgeting tool. And with that, you would make your answer. Okay, perfect. Because one of them had like the EANPV and the NPV. So EANPV, yeah. e if it's greater, we choose that one. So ENPV is literally the same thing as an NPV, but it's a benchmark version of it. Because when we're assessing projects, we obviously need to assess them for the same amount of years, or else it wouldn't make sense to like look at you know their monetary values because they're not at the same amount of years. So what you do with the ENPV is that you're essentially bringing them all to a benchmark for an effective specific year. So you're bringing down all these projects to a specific benchmark, and with that benchmark, you choose the biggest EMPV, and that would be your answer. You let's say you have three projects, right, and one has an EMPV like Project A, B, and C, and one has an EMPV of 400, the other has an EMPV of 200, and the other one has an EMPV of 550. You would just choose the one with the biggest value, which would be Project C, right? That's how you do it. However, their NPVs may have been, you know, 5,200, and this one would have been 1,200. But because you're benchmarking them and you're using a formula to give them to a specific yearly value, your decisions may be different, right? In this case, if I could just for some reason take off my drawing tool. In this case, if we didn't, you know, benchmark them, we would choose A. But A is a project with 10 years of cash flows, right? It's very possible. And then B could be a project with one year, and C could be a project with five years. So how do you make a strong decision if they're you know, in different lengths? They're, they're spanning different times. So with the ENPV formula, you're just benchmarking them towards a singular year value. And from there, you make your decision. So notice how we had different decisions. When we use our ENPV, we choose C because it's the best indicator. Does that make sense? I think so. Yes, perfect. Thank you so much. No problem, no problem. So that said, do we have any other questions? Any other concerns, ideas, pieces of conversation? What's up? Yeah, what's up? I just have a question. Do you have a more clear cut formula on how to calculate the payback period? Because I'm not gonna lie, it was uh, it was kind of confusing. Well, the the way to use it, it's um, once again, and I don't. There's no clear cut formula. I mean, there is, but it's not very clear cut. The formula. The first thing you need to do when you look at um, a payback period or a discounted payback period, you need to identify the point at which you are surpassing your initial investment, okay? Because that's gonna tell you, obviously, assuming that it's not happening at a one specific year, assuming it's happening between two years, so in this case, between year 10 and year 11, you need to find the point at which you're surpassing your initial investment. In this case, it seems to happen at year 11, right? It's happening at year 11. At year 11, you are making more money than your initial investment by this amount. That should be pretty clear, okay? So what you wanna figure out, right, is when along the period of year 10 and year 11, did you end up actually meeting this, the initial investment? 
when did you actually make you know 200 million dollars when did you break even when did you match your initial investment obviously i mean i don't know about you but imagine you receive your salary only on one day what would you do in between would you you know eat canned goods obviously money is being distributed evenly within the year or at least some some different ways within the year so how it would look like just for you to really understand why we're doing this formula the way we are so like let's say this is year 10 right this is year 12 well perhaps we're looking at it from a month to month perspective we got one two three four five six So we could have the first month, the second month, the third month, the fourth month, the fifth month, sixth, seven, eight, nine. I guess we could put this one as nine. This one is 10, 11, 12 months, right? We have 12 months within the year. You could have you know, 30 days for 12 months. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to assume that surely you are, you are making money throughout the year, surely these cash flows should be distributed at least evenly in a perfect world, right? That's, that's the idea. So what you're trying to figure out, assuming that these payments are being distributed every single month or every single day or every single year or every single like week, with that, you want to say, okay, well, at what point within year, oops, year 10 and year 11 did I get to break even? Was it between, you know, was it at month six? Was it at month seven? Was it at month two? That's why we're using this formula. So that's me trying to give you context. Now, now that we have context, what we could do is we clearly see that for us to reach our goal after year 10, right? Tell me, Georgia, how much money do we have after year 10? How much money do we make off this project? Uh, 30, 30, is it the 37 million 500? If we're making $10 million for the first five years, then $22.5 million for the next five years, obviously we should be at a bigger amount than, than that amount, yeah? Oh, okay. Um, sorry, the $162,500,000. Exactly. So we're at that amount. Amazing. That's how much total money we made, all right? That's how much total money we made. So how much money are we missing to attain our goal of $200 million? Can you tell me? How much are we missing? How much are we missing to get there? Um, 30, well, the 37 and a half. There you go. Amazing stuff. So we're missing 37 and a half million dollars to attain our goal. That's amazing stuff. But we do know that we're making $45 million within all of year 11, okay? Within all of year 11. We know we're making that much, yeah? Is that clear? Yeah, yeah, it is. Okay. So we know we're making $45 million across all of year 11. So what does that mean across all of year 11? That means at the beginning of year 10, all the way here, that's how much money we're making, okay? You can divide it by, you know, per month, per week, per day. We're not going to do all that. But the idea is that we're going to assume that that's how much money you made across the entire year, okay? Across the entire year. So then you would do $45 million, which is a total amount of money you made within that year. Okay, total amount of money you made. Whoops, sorry about that. Get back there, so sorry. So that's how much total money you made, all right? But how much did you need? You needed $37.5 million to be able to reach your goal. So what you could do to find how much exact time it took you to reach your goal you could just divide what you need by what you got within that year. You could divide what you need from what you got within that year. Okay, that's what's super important. And now if you divide 37 and a half million by 45 million, can you tell me what you get? I'm gonna, I'm gonna visualize it for you, it's gonna be dope. Uh, 0 0.83333. Yeah, so about, essentially 83.33%, right? That's a proportion that you got. Now let's go back to our little line that we did. Okay. We're going to have, uh, it's kind of ugly. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> I keep on making a mistake. My bad. Uh, sorry about that. 
So we're going to have our little line here. I believe we're looking at year 10 and year 11. So we have year 10 and we have year 11. Okay. And what this, what this little thing is telling you is that 83% of the year, okay, 83% of the year was needed for you to be able to gain the money to reach your goal. 83% of the year was needed for you to reach your goal. So for sure, you didn't attain year 11 yet, okay, in terms of like cash. Okay, that's for sure. So we're telling you that it took you- right, Our goal of surpassing our initial investment, right? Yeah, of meeting it, exactly. Okay, to break okay thank you. Exactly. So that's why you get something like eight, I mean, sorry, 10.83333 periodic. That's why, okay? That's why we're, because we're really looking at when do you literally meet that benchmark of your initial investment? Obviously, it's not a, it could be a goal for people. People want to make more money than that. But the idea is when do you break even? That's why we use this proportion game because we're literally trying to figure out, well, when the heck is this even happening? To give you a better visualization again, which I think it's going to be amazing, is that technically here, right? Technically here, we, we know, and I could even be more annoying. Let me, let me change the example a little bit, okay? Let me change the example a little bit. Check this out. Let's say that it was $25 million all across from year one all the way to year 15 for project A. All right. And we want to figure out when will you make you know, your $200 million back? When will you break even? Well, in this case, okay, if you look closely, in this case, could you tell me when it is, Georgia? Can you tell me when that happens? According to the little table. Sorry, can you repeat that for a second, please? The... Yeah, no problem. No problem. When are you breaking even? When? What is your payback period in this example right here? Oh, year nine, because we're at 225 million and the initial was 200 million. Okay, so maybe it's at another point. Maybe look at the year right before. Oh, year eight? Y yeah, year eight, because we meet the 200 million. Yeah, you're right. Exactly. So once again, that's exactly the point at, where, at which we made it. This was a specific example where obviously it was like perfectly distributed, right? You know, 25 million a year, you have a whole number of 200 million, it gets easy, right? It's gonna be eight years no matter what, it's just 200 divided by 25. But it gets tricky, right? It gets tricky when you get to numbers such as, you know, like we could have done $24 million, right? I, I, I'm going hard at it. <laughs> no problem, no problem. It's totally fine, Lean. It's I'm going above and beyond at this point. But what's interesting, uh, Georgia, if you want to, is that if we have $24 million, right? Obviously, now we're in a predicament because it's not a whole number. So we need to find that point at which we're breaking even. Clearly, it seems to be between year eight and year nine. Is that fair? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So then you would just do 200,000, I mean, 200 million divided by 24 million, and that's gonna give you your break even point, which is a point between eight, uh, year eight and year nine. However, this gets hard when we don't have consistent cash flows, especially when we're doing discounted cash flows, because they're not gonna be like the same, right? Because of the exponent. Every year it's gonna get smaller and smaller. So that's why this game of proportions, it helps when we're dealing with very bait numbers like this. So I hope that gave you a little bit of context. I hope it helped. Yeah, it's a little bit clearer. So I'm just going to assume as a general rule of thumb, it's the amount missing to meet your CF zero on the total amount you made that year, right? To yes, buy payback period? Of course. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Okay. That's perfect. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. I got it. No problem. All right. Well, that said, that was our session. And um, we'll see each other uh, after tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Have a good night. Bye. Bye-bye.